At Four Bears Casino and Lodge, we want you to work for fun. We're hiring workers who will create fun for our guests and have a fun time doing it. We offer flexible schedules, full-time, part-time, anytime. A $2,000 sign-on bonus means when you're off the clock, you can afford to have even more fun. Seeing a show? Exploring the epic sights or enjoying our amenities. Are you ready to work for fun? Apply today at forebearscasino.com. Ever tried reading while jogging, cooking, or even juggling flaming torches? Yeah, doesn't end well. But with audiobooks.com, you can conquer books without the circus act. Dive into over 450,000 titles, including more than 10,000 free ones. Get hooked on a bestseller. Find your next obsession, or finally read that classic you've been avoiding since high school. And here's the inside scoop. Sign up today for a free 30-day trial and snag your first three audiobooks on the house. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E. We have a liftoff. Yes, we have liftoff once again. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Big Truth Podcast. I'm sitting here with my man, one of my oldest friends, MC Esoteric, yeah. uh, from uh, Seven L and Esoteric fame, or fucking God Complex fame, or <laughs> you might know him from a little thing called Zaface. I don't. <laughs> you might know him from WMWM ninety one point seven FM Wednesdays three to six Shamrock's Greenhouse. I don't know how you know him, wow. but you know him from something. Wait, what? Let's what, <laughs> before we get into anything. What was the let's let's together piece the the, the lineup of. Salem State College Radio in, what was it, 95, 96? No, no. no. Closer to 92, 93, 90, 92, 90, 93, 94, 95. So, that's so, right, Somewhere yeah. 93, 95, I think it was the sweet spot for, for our relationship. <laughs> yeah. M- Monday was uh, DJ Curtis. Yes, sir. Tuesday was Truth's Freak Show. Yes, sir. Wednesday was uh, Shamrock's Greenhouse. That's right. Thursday was uh, Gus Diaz, I think. All right. That's that what that was missing. And then Friday was Benzo, the Gangsta <laughs> Mac, King of the Bozak, and all of that. I couldn't, wow. I couldn't remember Thursday. I yeah, couldn't Gus remember D. Thursday. Curtis uh, Delmar. Delmar, yeah. He had I, just uh, actually sent me a photo of him drinking the Zarface IPA at a club that he had it, you know, had been, he, I forget the name of the club or something, but he had posted a picture online, tagged me in it. And I was like, wow, man, it's cool. It's, it's funny how things go full circle. You know, we had an interesting relationship with, with, with Curtis because he was very uh, by the playbook in terms of um, on-air DJ activities. And we were more rebellious. So we were more pirate radio. Let's, Absolutely. let's, let's turn this, this university <laughs> into uh, a, a freak show. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I got thrown off twice. Yeah. And then, then there was that weird dude, Derek. Oh, the, the that threatened the president. Attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he threatened the president, and he got thrown off. Yes, he's, yeah, yeah. Very much. Uh, there's a, a satanic temple in Salem that I often think that he might be the uh, prime minister of. <laughs> yeah, or the, or the curator, or, Cura- or yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah, whatever. I'll I'll get a little closer to the mic. <laughs> yeah, we could probably do two or three hours on our experiences in Salem State and get him banned from playing certain <laughs> records on the radio or or suspended for a few weeks. Yeah, but, you know. You're saying that in your best radio voice, I think. I've changed my voice since we talked. I mean, we just did the best <laughs> podcast ever, but there was no mics on, and now we're here, and I'm kind of toning it back. But yeah. I did play some DOS FX records back then that got me suspended for a while. I re- the, the one thing that I remember that always makes me laugh from that is that you know a lot of times you hung out on my show. I hung out on your show. And then there was one time you had to take a bathroom break and you were gone for like 10 minutes, and I put on a Culture Club <laughs> record in the middle of your set. <laughs> Yes, uh, comma chameleon. You came back, and I remember you looked at me. You're like, "You're not really playing that, are you?" And I was like, "Oh yeah." yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you got you got so pissed off. Well, yeah, because I think back then, uh, you know, what you were playing kind of defined you as a person. And I, I was, you know, very hardcore, gangstar, 
Boogie Down Productions, Ultramagnetic MCs, and then if you're going to play Boy George, it's going to kind of mess up my whole <laughs> aesthetic. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking relax, dude. <laughs> Everyone knows you. You don't got to establish credibility anymore. <laughs> It's take, gotta, take it easy, buddy. I need my guard up, man. That's kind <laughs> of what keeps me fueled, man. No, I know. But we did, for you know, for everyone that don't know, me and Seamus have been friends since 92 or 93. Yeah. But before we even get into anything serious, I do want to say, um, and it's a long time coming, I definitely want to say, dude, I'm actually literally fucking proud of you. Like, we've been friends for a long time. Like I said, 92, we've been a lot of, through a lot of shit together. We were roommates for a lot of years. And I saw your career, like, come from, you know, when we were just fucking idiots at Salem State, young kids, to now. And you stuck with it. And everybody that doesn't, that doesn't understand that longevity is part of the key to success. Like, you stuck with it through thick and thin, when times were thin, when times were good. Um, and you didn't give up and now you're surviving just on your music, which was always your dream, which I remember from when we were kids. So yeah. fucking kudos and congratulations, dude. And, 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 and for whatever it's worth, I'm proud of you for doing that and sticking with it. And I've always meant to tell you that, but oh, it's man. better to tell you now. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. That was worth hearing that from you was worth the drive <laughs> out to Chopper Head Studios. On its own, on its own. And by Chopper Hood <laughs> Studios, he means we're sitting at the counter of Chopper Head Custom Cycles. It's the only way to do it, man. <laughs> on a Sunday afternoon. Yes, sir. And the first day of daylight savings time. Yep. So actually, yep. it's a, it's a lot brighter out than it should than it normally would be at this point. It is, yeah. And I'm so, sure you're going to bring the darkness, though. So <laughs> no, uh, no, 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 dude. <laughs> but I know I appreciate it, man. You know, yeah. and and you know, it, it shouldn't go without mentioning that. Uh, you know, you really provided a lot of the inspiration, a lot of the springboard, the platform, everything from the beginning to I can't believe him. I'm, I'm, I'm telling him this. I'm giving him these props right now and he's checking his fucking phone. <laughs> no, so, no, you know no, what? no. You know what? Fuck that. So <laughs> I started rapping like three or four years ago. It just became this yeah. sensation. Into the, nothing to do with into the Internet sensation. <laughs> no, I wasn't checking my phone. I was actually making sure that the sound was off okay. so it didn't ring when we were here. <laughs> gotcha. But yeah, I mean, honestly, um, you and RLA were some of the first guys I ever heard that I, rapping recorded material that I could actually see in the flesh and have a conversation with. And it was so inspiring, man. And, you know, you really took those steps and showed me what DIY really meant, you know, and it was very, uh, and here we are, man, you know? Yeah. And we're both here and we're, we're here on, we're still here doing this shit. 30, no, wait, 92. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I've, I've never, math has not been a strong point. So 92 <laughs> to 2002, to 2012 to two, yeah 30 years yeah, yeah it's, 30 it's years okay. later and we're still we're still here doing doing what we do and uh you know and there's been a lot of fun along the way and 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 now even with the stuff you guys are doing basically your your own label and yep. and that's fucking awesome and, and and so many people I was I was talking to Selene about this off the mic like you know, I know he does stuff with a lot of different labels, including Brick. So I'm yeah. not not stepping on my my own foot, but like you know, I was like, dude, like in this day and age, like you can just keep releasing shit. You don't have to do everything through a label anymore. You can do stuff on your own, and you can get it out. Like literally, this podcast, ten minutes after we're done recording, we can get it out to the entire world. Yeah, like you can do that with a song. Yeah, and you don't need anybody else to to, to facilitate that for you anymore because you have. Um, so so much social media and so many outlets for like, um, you know, like Spotify or whatever that people listen to. You don't got to take 500 records and f put them in a trunk with like five dudes and drive to Big Daddy Distribution in New Jersey yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. anymore and, and try and hope someone picks up the record and distributes it to stores because there's not many stores anymore. It's all digital. Like so yeah. like in minutes, this this could broadcast to the entire world and a song could go out to the entire world. It's, ins it's insanity it, when you really think about it, but it's awesome. And it's time. It's a good time to be an independent artist. I think definitely there's so many, I guess, pros and cons to it. But I mean, you know, as you said, driving out to New Jersey with a truck load of records or, or a back seat of a Volvo full of records or however it was, I think George drove or some shit. Maybe we fell asleep somewhere in a, in a, in a, at a gas station parking lot or something overnight it's blurry. I don't remember that it was actually a sleepover situation. No, that was with Mad Soul. There was a couple times. Matt no, no, but that one it was it was me, you, George, yeah. Yeah. Mad Soul, yeah, and Trevor. Yeah, right? we slept in a car, and and it's no one's like a, a very small guy, no. and there was all of us plus like five hundred records. I, I feel like today, 
you know, if you take advantage of it, you know, the type of stuff that we like to rhyme about or, or make lyrics, you can make them more relevant. You don't have to worry about a dated punchline or something. If you really have the inspiration to come out, make some type of lyric about whatever happened today, you could really launch it on Instagram tomorrow and be the first guy with the coronavirus punchline or, yeah, or, yeah. or whatever. You know, these well, whoever's elected president, you could be like you could have you could exactly. be like you could be like the, the merch companies for like the Super Bowl that print that print both sides, <laughs> right? And then and then like whoever wins, like like those those go to sale and then the rest gets shipped off to like yeah. some third world country, like yeah. and, and you'll see like Super Bowl thirty, like whoever like didn't win, like on some like poor fucking kid in some we're like wearing that shit but you could write punchlines for both and be the first person to come out with something it's true about that like it's true it's it, it, it's crazy the the pros and cons and the positives and the minuses of the internet is an infinite discussion but so that everyone understands me and so um go back a lot of years and so there's going to be a lot of tangents on this podcast but to kind of just set it off set the tone um for people that might not be as familiar with you, I'm sure everybody at least like knows you, but kind of give a background on yourself and, and how you got involved in music. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of iterations. Um, you know, there was God Complex. There was yeah. 7L and Esoteric. I'm sure there was stuff, you know, b- before that. And then and the Zarfi stuff and yeah. Army of the Pharaoh, all all that stuff, man. I mean, you're involved. You got your hands in a... In a, in a lot of things in the underground music world, especially in in, in regards to underground hip hop and and you know everything like that, so kind of give give everyone kind of like a little background information, and then you know okay. we'll go from there. Yeah, no, I've just been always attracted to the the world of emceeing, man. Since you know listening to suck MCs in in whatever eighty four, whatever that was the first time I really decided I really wanted to to rap, and then th- as things progressed, started hearing Ice T, Public Enemy. BDP and you know these people inspired me to actually rhyme and I was actually crazy enough to attempt it and then crazy enough to follow through with continuing to record and I'm not just saying this because I'm with you but then I met you you know what I'm saying you you were like hey you know we could put these this stuff on vinyl and I was like what are you talking about you have to go you have to go to New York and meet some guys in suits and all this type of thing <laughs> I had I was very ignorant at the time and you showed me that you can actually put things on record and sell them and get make a profit off of it. And that was the most inspiring thing that really never hit me. And then we kind of took it and ran. So it went from the God Complex thing with Karma and 7L. And, uh, you know, there were some records before that. And then we went to um, just 7L and Esoteric. And, and, we you know, we met up with Jedi Mind Tricks, you know, in the, the mid-90s. And um, we had the Rebel Alliance record. There were so many different... Uh, what do you call it? Incarnations? Is that the word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, okay. or iterations. So many iterations. I knew it was an I word. And um, eventually, after so many years of of, of fighting the fight, we we started the Zarface stuff with um, Deck from Wu Tang, and and that just really kind of took on a life of its own through. I think just a, a chemistry with us and a, a, a shared love for the hip hop that we grew up on and comic books and pop culture. And it just um, has been uh, very rewarding in a lot of different levels. Sure, man. And I, I mean, like, what was cool is that when we were coming up, like, a lot of stuff that people don't understand is that, like, there wasn't the level of like underground music that there is now. And, um, you know, I took a lot of stuff from like the punk rock scene, like my old hardcore band had records out. And then I was like, I started that label brick. And Mm -hmm. the first release was actually a hardcore seven inch. And then it was like, no, we can just put you guys out or do whatever. Like you, you were my friend from school. Like, yeah, put my boy out, like, you know, whatever. And, um, and then it just kind of, um, took off from from there like and but at that same time that same kind of sentiment was brewing in different cities and all over the place and uh you know you know definitely new york and and california and every every place had their own little thing going and uh it just kind of took off and it's still the funny thing is all the stuff that was mainstream then you don't really hear from now but all these independent artists that were putting in the work back then they're still around 
like Jedi Mind Tricks still yeah. around. Vinny's still putting out Jedi Jedi records yep. and solo records, and yeah. even dudes like you know Apathy. We met a little bit later, but not that much later. Right. He's still around doing stuff. Like yep. all the guys that we kind of grew up with are, are still, even even Mark Trademark. Yeah, he's doing sure. like he's got his new record out. I see it on Instagram every day with a new funny ad for it. Yeah. Like everybody is still around doing stuff. So you know, like in some ways, like not getting commercial success back then was almost a blessing in a way, maybe because I don't know why, but like people that were doing stuff on a commercial level back then, you don't really hear from or see from too much if right. they're still alive, you know, right. that is. but right. you know, well, everybody on the underground is still here I feel in like, both scenes too. Like even in the hardcore scene, like dudes back then, they're still here now. I really think that as far as, you know, seven on hysterical, me and George and our chronic crew, is concerned we owe a lot to the aesthetic of the, the diy thing with the vinyl you know that you kind of showed us because it was like discovering fire when you actually put it in front of me that we can put this stuff on vinyl and sell it in a store you know what i mean it was like our goal was like wow maybe we can get it on 889 you know or some type of radio show yeah, just to play yeah, our right, demo. Sort of, yeah and i was like wow that's a demo but we can actually consider it more than a demo and judge it as a final product and put it on a record, you know, you have to find your audience. And, uh, you know, there's a big audience for um, the stuff that we're doing. Oh, well, you know. <laughs> why, why was that conversation off mic so much better? <laughs> there's a big audience for what we're doing. Yeah, and, man. Uh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Shake the Tito's for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, this whole podcast, by the way, we, this is our first uh, read. This is... My first podcast ever, I think, and, and I just want to say that this is about to you. Don't, don't say read. I am in oh. no way, shape, or form sponsored by anybody. Okay. Uh, oh, so there's, but okay. we are both yeah. mutual fans. Like what I will say is that as as me and Seamus grew up, um, we were both uh, very much vodka guys, yeah. and we graduated from Grey Goose <laughs> to Tito's some years ago. For sure. And man. Uh, this whole podcast is is being fueled by Tito's, yes. though not monetarily sponsored by Tito's. No. Um, and we've had a few of them before we even started this. So, and uh, yeah, as we go, this will get progressively more interesting, and you can thank Tito's for that. Yes, sir. I thank Tito's for pretty much a lot of this uh, creative flow here. It is the vodka for dogs. We're both uh, avid dog lovers, and um, truth lured me here by telling me he was going to bring his dogs here, <laughs> and there's not a fucking dog in sight, but there's, a, there's about 1,300 choppers in the back, <laughs> all types of chrome, sissy bars, and uh, helmets, and... Uh, Kevlar flannels, Kevlar gloves. Yeah, man. There's not a, there's not a stay German protected. Shepherd. There's not, you know, when we lived together for a while, uh, he had a, a, a bulldog named Otto. Yeah. Oh, rest in peace. Rest in peace, Otto. Yes, rest sir. in peace, Logan. Let's yeah. have a drink for the, for yeah. the dogs that eat around because sure. sometimes they're, they're always part of family and sometimes they're more important than even blood relatives. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. All right. I'm crying. <laughs> Yeah, no, I know, I know. I know it's a little soon for you, man, yeah. like compared to, to, to Otto. Otto's yeah. old school. Yes. He was the he was the, the bulldog with the big bum leg. Yeah. He had that weird leg and I, I got him from a rescue. Yeah. He was fucking awesome. And uh bringing him and and forty. Forty forty, yeah. 40, yeah. 40 repped at the Bellflower Mansion. He did? And she, she came with she, me. She did. <laughs> fucking <laughs> asshole. <laughs> Fucking asshole! Forty is, a, is an I know. ambiguous name. You could be. You could. You no, know, no, no. I know a I, lot of girls named Forty. Yeah. No. A one hundred percent. Like, in your defense, like when you see a bulldog, you never think female. No, you don't. You don't. It, you don't. It's just. It's true. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. So Forty was at the Bellflower Mansion in Dorchester. Yep. She came with me to Providence. Yep. And she came with me to uh, when I lived in Dartmouth. Yep. And that that she passed like in Dartmouth. But the best. Always, she was my best dog ever, yeah. and literally even died the best death. Like she waited till everybody was home, wow. and then it was like ten at night, and Grim was there, my sh shepherd. Yeah, yeah. Everybody was there around her, and that's when she went. Right. This shit's wow. tough. Let's let's fucking go on to some other shit. Dude. We had so many laughs earlier. <laughs> we had so many now laughs. Like, now was, wow. what? Like hit the record button. It's all heavy. Oh man. Yeah. I uh, so I was, getting. Remember we said we're gonna have a bunch of fucking. 
we're gonna go off yeah. and then we're gonna bring it back in. So yeah. so, so you started. I, I want to show you some pictures of, pictures of Logan. <laughs> yeah. So he's <laughs> fucking asshole. <laughs> there was you know I watched the movie last night, Spencer Confidential, Mark Wahlberg movie, and there was a moment about forty five seconds with this dog named Pearl in it, and it was Pearl was his dog, and it just crushed me. What dude? This is we didn't talk about this earlier. Literally, I watched the same movie oh. fucking last night. Fucking in. Yeah. Is, talk about synchro, synchronicitous yeah. or, or whatever the word is. Yeah, uh, yeah dude, literally yeah. watched it last night. Wow, man. Yeah, so there was a moment where he connected with the dog, and I was like, oh, man, am I am I welling up watching this Mark Wahlberg moment here right now? Can I really talk about this? But the dog should get a fucking Oscar or Golden Globe or whatever they award for because the dog Pearl was panting and looking and just giving exactly what – I think they needed for that moment, and I forget who the the guy was, but they said never work. Uh, who was it? The rule is never work with children or dogs. Oh, dogs. Yeah, or no, dogs, I heard right? that same thing. Yeah, but that dog delivered, you know. And um, back to the hip hop shit. Man. Oh no, actually, let's take it back for everyone that doesn't know. Bellflower Mansion was an institution in the Boston scene. From I couldn't even tell you the years or whatever. Yeah. But but me and Seamus lived together in uh in in it was on the Dorchester South Boston line basically. And uh, and our neighbor, speaking of Marky Mark, right? Didn't our <laughs> neighbors below us have something to, like they played? He used to come over and play cards or some shit like that. So it, something, was, it was definitely some scenario like that. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. some weird shit with that. For sure. Um, but yeah, that was the little tie into that. But, yeah. the, but the, that apartment really was, was a major um, building block for everything that we've done, I think. And with with Braun and and you know the, Matt Saluka and Dan Mashoni, I, I, can I put government names on this as far as roommates? Who, who cares? Yeah, I yeah, mean Dan Mashoni. It's actually better that you put his government name out because because <laughs> you know he's going to freak out so much harder <laughs> that you put his full name out. You might as well have just given his social security over the air because now. He He's going down a fucking wormhole that he's not going to come back for like two or three years. You want to talk about conspiracy theorists. He is the Dr. Original. J, the Dr. J of conspiracy theories. And, you know, I, I think uh, anyone that's, that follows this podcast or follows truth in general knows that, you know, there's not a lot of people that are more um, skeptical than him. But Dan Mashoni gives him a run for yeah. his money. Dan Mashoni makes me feel like so mainstream. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 if I need validation that I've gone too far, I'm like, what would Michoni think? And yeah. then I'm like, no, nah, I'm, all right. I'm, I'm, my perspective's all right. Well, yeah. When you and I get off the subway, come home from from eating a slice of pizza, we walk into the house and he's there sitting with his legs crossed, with fucking sixteen books out, <laughs> like the lights out. Sixteen, <laughs> sixteen. Well, I don't know why you're being so so. Sixteen hundred. Sixteen hundred is yeah. more like the whole. I remember coming home and the whole living room was just covered with piles yeah. of books. It looked looked like like an ancient painting or something of like like a scholar from like the 1400s just yeah. covered in piles of books yeah it was like a yeah it was and the like, internet existed like you didn't need yeah. all of those physical books right he was he had and i think out of the 1600 books 1200 were in german and yeah. he was transliterating <laughs> yeah them, yeah and that was kind of his mission and that's why <laughs> he was there and that's, a, that's a, one of the, the cool things about i think our circle is that he is a genuine fucking madman yeah like absolutely fucking, like anytime i'd go in a bar with this guy <laughs> he would take the battery out of his phone and this was this was like 15 years ago this wasn't like now no no this is like you know he would take everything out and and leave his phone in the car this is i think before iphones even had there's like a flip phone type of situation he's a, really on the cutting edge yeah, like, it was flip phones and uh blackberries blackberries yeah 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 well, no, no, he was he was well ahead of the curve on fucking psychosis and fucking craziness, and, but awesomeness too. Like yeah. we always had, it, me and you were the constant, and we always had another roommate that was always different in their own way, different, and it was awesome. Different and, flavors, man. Different. Like Matt was the, the last Eagle Scout, oh. and now he's what? Are, what are the uh, wine guys called? That the uh, uh, sommelier. Yeah, now yeah. he's a sommelier, and yeah. then we had Beyonder yeah. Braun that yeah. was. Just uh, uh, discovering the wonders of alcohol. Remember his 21st birthday? And we spent half the night trying to find him. <laughs> We're not even going to bring it in. We won't bring this on to the, to the podcast. <laughs> There's too many inside jokes. Oh but God. I remember we came home and this boy, Jose, was hanging out of the car. We thought he was yeah. literally shot and yeah, dead. <laughs> it looked like he got shot. Remember That's that? Was it you? Me and you, we walked home one night. 
and we didn't we step over a dead body that was on Boston yeah, Street? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's fucking old. <laughs> and this was before phones, so we couldn't call anyone. And we were just like, all right, well, uh, was, we, we got to deal with this to get home. There are certain things that people remember, like like George remembers the fact when we were at uh, BC Radio, there was a time when Onyx came in. Onyx came into the radio station. Matt Soul was DJing. Me and Seven O were there, just kind of as co-hosts. And, and Onyx came in, and then Fred Rose Star came up to me, pulled on my polo sweater, and was like, yo, that shit's tough. I don't remember it at all. George remembers it like it was yesterday. Yeah. And I, my mind is blown that I don't remember it, because that's all no, I no. ever wanted. In that time frame, for him to do that, that would have blown my mind. Yeah. That's all I wanted, <laughs> and I don't remember it. Yeah. But that story with Jose hanging out of the car like a dead body, I can, like I'll remember that to the day. I yeah, die. <laughs> and Braun, Braun was like curled up somewhere. That's well, I, yeah. I don't remember where, but I he remember he was like curled yeah. up somewhere. He, no, he was on way, the street or yes, something. He was way down the street, <laughs> and he was not with Jose, who was in the car with the hazards on, hanging out of the fucking. <laughs> we're like, oh shit, the dude's dead. Yeah. What the fuck yeah. happened? Yeah, I was like, I was like, if we're gonna take this friendship to a new level, because we have to deal with a dead body, and we just walked over another dead body, and then. <laughs> this could just be a whole different podcast. Yeah, I know, I know. The stupidity that <laughs> happened in that, especially when Braun came in, everybody else kind of kept me and you tempered, like Mashoni and, and, and Saluka. Yeah. And then when Braun came in, it was yeah. like no holds barred. And then, like, literally there was, like, a South Boston family living under us that I feel so bad for because we would come home every night at, like, 3 in the morning fucking oh retardedly God. fucking drunk, like, breaking pans over, smashing pans over our heads and punching the fridge. The stupidest thing ever. Fridge punch. <laughs> fridge punch, yeah. And we would just punch the fridge as hard, hard as, hard as, as we, we could and try to move it. And then, like, we would smash pans over Braun's head, like, cookie, your, your sugar cookie. <laughs> You still like sugar cookies. Oh, I love them. Yeah, <laughs> and then we would smash the pan to make the sugar cookies over Braun's head. And, like, there was just so much dumb shit, like, every fucking night, though. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't like, a, a Tuesday, like, a Friday or Saturday. Well, yeah, it was mostly the weekends, but. Yeah. But it was, like, every fucking week. It was week. a tough time. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a great time. But there was, a, the, the thing with Braun and, and me and you, there was a certain thing where I think him and I thought it would be a good idea to start drinking maybe before you had started drinking so we would be ahead of the situation <laughs> yeah and then fights would start happening and we had the situation where we we're both fighting on the floor and <laughs> he like tried to take it to me saying you want to get for real i remember, I remember <laughs> right? That. Right? so it came out the situation where we got for real and yeah. it was like we wound up fucking rolling around on the floor i remember the night I don't remember where we went. It was probably someone stupid like a whiskey. Whiskey Park. Whiskey Park. Yeah. But I remember we killed like, I drank, I literally was like 19 shots of Jägermeister before. Oh, I'm sure. Before we went out. And then that was like, I, I can't even drink. Like someone gave me a shot last night. There was a, a terror played and uh, someone gave me a shot last night. And I was so, it was so hard to drink that shot because I, uh, there was a, I think it was Doug Stanhope had a whole comedy routine about drinking liquor, okay. uh, quitting liquor, but doing it one at a time by overdoing it. Oh, and that's okay. what I overdid Jaeger that night before yeah. we even went out. And I was like, to this day, I can't even drink Jaegermeister anymore. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, Terror, uh, I'd become friends with Scott Vogel through Vinny. We met them at some show or whatever. And he was like, yo, come out to, uh, just, just the other day, come out. They were playing in Providence or whatever. And, um, I had the kids or whatever. I was like, I, I can't bring the kids because Andrew was going out. Or whatever. You don't want to bring your kids to a terror show? No, but he was like, bring the kids. Bring them. Cameron is playing over on this stage, and we're playing on this stage, and it's going to be a crazy show. I'm like, I can't bring my kids to see you guys or see fucking Cameron. Like, what are you talking about? My, my daughter's five. <laughs> you know? But those are, those are some great guys. Yeah, you know, th that was the thing yesterday. In, in, uh, in Hartford. Hartford? No, no, no. It was in Providence. There was no camera on. It was just it was terror and a bunch of bands that I, I'm not familiar there? with. I was there last night, but I didn't talk to Scott. I, I went in. I was very antisocial, okay. and then I saw my friend Tom from an old band called Grudge Holder, and we were drinking. And someone, I think it was him or someone, got me a shot of Jägermeister, okay. and I was like, and I thought about it. And I was like, oh, yeah. but oh, I couldn't show any weakness. I had to do the shot. Yeah, and I yeah, did it like no it. problem. But I was like, I didn't want to do it. You didn't want to. <laughs> full disclosure. I didn't want to do it, but I did it. Sometimes you got to do that, man. I, I'm I'm actually very good at 
accepting the shot. And when everyone's doing the shot, I will like do this like Magic Johnson like spin move and kind of put it over here, and nobody seems to notice. And then I can kind of go on through. There. If I took that shot, I'd be out for the night. But it's like a. You just fucked yourself royally now because everyone's going to look for the full shot on the I box. Know. You better fucking do a new little tip or something it's to not, it. It's not a full shot. Well, it is a full shot, but then I'm like, yo, hey, I got, I got more shots. You want this? And then whoever is the most you know, drunk of the crew is going to be like, yeah, and you just drink it. And I'm like, that, then we just keep moving. <laughs> Problem solved. Problem solved because 7L is the guy that will be like, he'll get in the mood and he'll be like, yo, let's get more shots. And all of a sudden he's got more shots. I'm like, dude, I can't do any more shots. <laughs> and he knows that once I get to a point, I will just hop in an Uber and get out of here because I know my limits and I've found myself in situations where it's like, this is, I can... Luckily, I've been able to kind of... See, I haven't been on the road with you guys in a long time. Yeah. So I feel like yeah. I need to go out because we need oh, to yeah. we need to reassess where everything's at. <laughs> because <laughs> no, you're not the guy that came out <laughs> modeling your Boston Music Award outfits. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, the leather pants, sorry, the leather pants, and the hang- and, the, and the bandana. <laughs> Wait, well, where's the bandana? I didn't wear a bandana. You, I'm, I'm oh, around the neck, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I'm not even gonna go like. Yeah, it was the, like yeah. it was like a skinny big gay Al. From, it, from it, South Park. Yeah, no, yeah, there was a time where I was pushing the limits as <laughs> you far were, as clothing. I you felt were. like I felt I had this confidence about me where I was like, you know what? I'm going to go this way. Everyone else can go hey, that way. But you know what? It led to Burberry, which yeah. basically led to the cover of Dangerous Connection. Yeah. And yeah. that's, you know, that was a that was a pretty pretty uh pretty serious record for you guys. Yeah, it was a, it was that was a, a a big record for us and, you know, we shot that cover. My man Lou Holiday shot the photo. It was right in Dorchester across from KFC. And speaking of that, KSC is one of my funniest memories. I think it was with you. Was it me and you that went in there and there was a rat running loose, yeah, running yeah, amok? Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> and people were like standing on the yeah. – on- <laughs> They were standing on the tables, yeah, yeah. <laughs> freaking out, yeah. and then we just kind of turned around and walked out. And, but <laughs> the best, I'm not going to get into it, but it was just like the whole situation was fucking hysterical. Like, there's people freaking out about a rat running around, standing on the tables of a KFC. <laughs> the whole fucking, Dude, I can't even get into it. I was still, and I was still ready to get my uh, like three piece drumstick, two thighs, and some mashed potatoes. And yeah. I was like, hey, you know what? Let, let the rat run around. I mean, the rat is, I'm not eating the rat. The rat is just kind of doing its thing. I, and I talked about this the other day. I don't know why I got squeamish about it because when we were kids, we'd go to the shows at the rat, like hardcore shows at the rat. And literally right next door was Captain Nemo's Pizza. Oh, yeah. And Rats there was everywhere. one time me and Ryan, um, you remember Ryan, my yeah. old friend Ryan? And we were sitting in Captain Nemo's in a fucking sewer rat, like, like the king of all sewer rats came out okay, and walked into the middle of like the dining area, like what, what you would call the dining area of yeah. a pizza shop in the Boston in the late eighties, early nineties. That was a downstairs, like it was on the same level as Ryan family amusements and a big fucking sewer rat came out into the middle of the dining area. And I just remember we just looked at it and we were like, eh. And just yeah. kept eating pizza, and it didn't even fucking didn't blink an eye. Yeah. But then later, I don't know why I was like, "You were all right," and I was like, "Eh, let's fucking get out of here with the KFC fucking situation." Well, yeah, there was a you know I don't know if you want this on the show, but you know there was a period where we had a a dead mouse in our apartment <laughs> for days. <laughs> for days. <laughs> All I, I don't remember that, but, but I remember that Matt Saluka threw a fucking fit because the mouse ate his chips. <laughs> or, like he, or, there was, or there was a hole in the bag of chips and he, he was eating them and he didn't realize. <laughs> he realized that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. Matt was the most, uh, I mean, he's still alive today, but he, he was very, very much the antithesis. I mean, he loved hip hop and was actually a really, really big part of everything that we do. But um, he was very much different in terms of, I remember the, the girl that I was dating then used to call him Mama Matt because Matt would clean up after all of us and he'd run around, you know. And he was, he was literally the last Eagle Scout. He was an Eagle yeah. Scout and he hold those ideals true. And it's not a bad thing. <laughs> I know we're laughing like fucking ass, yeah. like heathen fucking assholes right yeah, now, yeah, yeah. but that's how he knows us anyway. So it's not like offending him, but right. he held those like values he did. and it didn't make any sense. No, no. <laughs> but yeah. like, why are you living here? 
Right. And I, <laughs> I think it kind of came uh, as a love of the music. But he rolled with PMD, a VPMD. Yes. And they bonded on some Eagle Scout shit. I don't mean to put that out there into the universe. <laughs> I don't think. I'm on a stool. Don't make me fall off the fucking stool. I, there's no back here. There's no sissy bar. I know. This there's no stool. sissy bar on these seats. <laughs> that's true. And then my mind was blown. <laughs> but that's how they, that's how they like bonded. It and is. then he put out a record based on, on that. Yeah. Like literally based on like the bond of like an Eagle Scout. He is the guy that hooked up the, the first speaking real words with uh, uh, Inspector Deck because he was working it loud and he was working with us. And, you know, it came about where, you know, we had this this record and we're like, we need a feature on it. And it was before pe- people were doing features and stuff. And I was like, See, that's we- I didn't realize that was my- I thought that was Sean C or Joe. Well, Sean, C- well, Vinyl Reanimators, they did the beat. We recorded at Sean C's in Brooklyn. And Deck came by. And, and before we get off that, yeah. I can't get into the details of this. You weren't there for this. It was me and Kama. And uh, one of the most epic nights of my life involved going to Sean C's house in Brooklyn. Yeah. And then he lived above, like, the little the Indian bodega. Yeah. And we went out with him. No, no, it was Pakistani dudes. Okay. And they brought us out into New York, but, like, an illegal... Oh, Pakistani yeah. version of New York that like through Queens and through like crazy shit that I can't really get into on the air, but it was one of the most epic nights of my life. Yeah, and I wasn't there. I was there, but I I did not. Go you didn't come that. with us. Yeah. I don't know where you were. Yeah, but I remember you were there. But you didn't. You weren't out with us for the for the main event. I guess. I think but, I did one of the take the safe route type of things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shit that I regret. But, well, it, it would have either been. It probably would have been. Could have been the best decision of your life. Yeah. Yeah, if it had, had things turned out a little minutely differently your night sounds like uh, a script from the hangover or yeah like exactly that, exactly it was, it was basically on that level so so uh saluker uh was working at loud records and uh yeah so he and he kind of connected the dots man and and um i was in the studio with deck and street life and uh his cousin dl and we're recording speaking real words and that was actually kind of like the origin story for Zarface. And, and we didn't know then, you know, what we would be on to years later, but it was actually the initial spark for the whole thing and kind of formed the relationship. Sure. And, you know, earlier on when I said, you know, I was proud of you for, for sticking to what you do. Um, and I, di- I didn't really get into this at that point. And this kind of is a good point to, to interject on that. Like knowing you as we, as, we, as you know, when we grew up, you know, because even though we were in our teens and early twenties, we were still growing up. Like, yeah. you were always into like the comic shit and, and Star Wars shit and whatever shit that was not popular yeah. in fucking hip hop or or any music genre at that time. But you stuck fucking with it, and it saw for a circle. Because I don't care who the fuck you are. Like, if you grew up in the seventies when you were a kid, you probably read comic books, definitely. And it came full circle, and that. Like when you introduce Zarface, all the merchandising and marketing off of that is fucking endless because it's fucking perfect. But that aside, like for me, you never changed who you were to try and succeed. You always stayed who you were. And then it just at some point like that came around where it was like that could attain a level of success or like acceptance that wasn't there when we were just starting out. So I always give you big fucking props. That's when I said like respect for sticking to your guns and sticking with it because like, you know, some kid might be into some shit right now and it's not the the cool shit, but like it, it could be at some point, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you know, like just stick to who you are and be real about shit and success will find you in one way or the other. Like if you, if you stick with it, like, like who would have thought like when we grew up, it was like fucking gangster rap, dude. Like, do you know what I mean? Like no one was thinking about comic books or the shit you were rapping about back then. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, but you know, most of those dudes, were on the same wavelength but they were just portraying like a fantasy not all of them but right. a lot of them you know what i mean so right. like that's what i meant when i said respect to you for always sticking to your guns and doing what you did on your own terms yeah. and then finding success with that because Thank you. because that's 
important shit, dude. Like, and it's not for me. It's just yeah. important shit for the for the world and the industry and and for people. You know what I mean? I appreciate you saying sticking to my guns, but I'd prefer if you said sticking to my E thirty three uh, carbine rifle blasters, which is what Boba Fett would. Uh, All right, you're first. getting a little deep for me at this point. Like, you oh, know, come take, on. take it back, dude. See, we were just talking about the Mandalorian a little while. I, I ago. was, and you know? what I was saying was. Like, that fucking saved the whole Star Wars franchise in a way, dude. Oh, like, yeah. that was a good fucking setup, dude. Oh, man. Home run. Home run. Grand yeah. slam. Absolutely. I respect the fucking Favreau for yeah. doing that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and, and wrestling out of George Lucas's fucking hands and, and, and doing right by it. Because George Lucas would have fucked it up at this point. We, yeah, we can't really. As I say, like, back in the day, you know, I think you and I kind of formed a friendship based on probably our, our personalities, sense of humor and stuff. But, I mean, it was also we had a lot of musical um similarities that we could fall back on but i mean i think could always fall back on things like our past ig88 boba fett like how many people know who that is how many people voluntarily now they're cultural icons but back then it was kind of like these are like just very obscure guys from from the from the empire strikes back sure but if you were a kid of the 70s and you had a little bit of fucking nut like you, you were cool with the bounty hunters, and you wished that shit would have got developed. Definitely, I don't care who you oh, yeah. are. That's like, what I mean. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely, absolutely. And that's why we always like, were like, well, we were cool. We just you know, we were on the radio, we were doing similar shit. Yeah, and, you know, whatever. But that other shit, like that, wasn't cool at the time. Like we would talk about and always laugh about and whatever and think about. But but it, absolutely, like like if you were a kid of the seventies, you liked Star Wars. Yeah. If you didn't, there was something wrong with you. Yeah, or you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Right, but. It came to this point where John Favreau was able to make this uh, uh, palatable for for us, and it, we can enjoy it on a like sophisticated level in a way. It was believ not believable, but I mean, you have I an IG unit that was super believable, dude. <laughs> Super believable. It I thought just, it was a documentary. I didn't even know I was watching a fictional uh, work of uh, a work of fiction when I saw, was watching it. It was just a. It was this thing that, that we could enjoy that was not really. I I believe you, me, and Jimpy went to see the Phantom Menace at when it opened, and we first saw first laid our eyes on Jar Jar Binks, and we were all sitting in the chair like, "What the fuck is this?" Oh yeah, Lucas we lived through that yeah. together. <laughs> You that, know, together. Yeah. And I, and I, and Wait, are you saying you have PTSD from the Phantom Menace? Oh, without a doubt. <laughs> without a doubt, man. We and lived through it and survived it. We did. <laughs> and, you know, we left the theater. I was like, oh, man, I'm with my boys. This is so depressing. This is like we went to see the new Star Wars. It's like it's like it, it was crushing in a way. It and, was. And no, it definitely know? was. And then it was like, what the fuck is wrong with George Lucas? You, you made the best shit ever and the worst yeah. shit ever. Yeah. He yeah. just lost touch. It's like when dudes like get out of like music game, like whether it's hardcore or hip hop, yeah. and then they try and come back and it yeah. just doesn't quite work. Over the years, now, um, that came out in the mid 90s, late 90s, 97 or something like that. My son got into those, those um, prequels. He likes them. He really enjoys them. He thinks Jar Jar Banks is cool and things like that. So I've developed a soft spot for it. So I have to entertain pod but, racing. Because it was because it was either develop a soft spot for that or yeah. develop a, a weird a weird, a weird like uh, like wall between you and your son. Yeah, exactly. So, like, so, all right. So as a good father, you, you developed a soft spot. Like, and that's the takeaway from this whole from this whole uh, podcast episode. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's the thing like I mean I, I felt myself becoming this dad when my son have has his friends over immediately and he has them over a lot my guard goes up immediately like don't touch this don't touch that don't touch this and how many kids can resist touching like a, a, a an action figure still in its plat like still in the thing and you know I don't want to be that guy I don't want to be the guy from the Lego movie that's like, don't tell, you know, uh, uh, general business. <laughs> you're, losing, <laughs> you're losing me on references. I don't have a kid. So like Lego, Lego movie, I, I haven't seen that okay. one. <laughs> All right. I just don't want to be the bad guy that's telling his kid and his friends not to touch that Stormtrooper helmet. <laughs> don't touch the fucking Cobra Commander helmet. Those are just there to inspire me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Don't touch my fucking toys. Yeah, you're telling kids not to touch your toys, it's, and that's is that, what it comes down. But to. I recognize that the truth is, uh, is that I really I had a real conflict with that because in the basement I have all these comic books 
that I consider valuable to me. Some are valuable to everyone, but I mean, a lot of them are valuable to me. And him and his friends like to dig through them. And I'm like, that's great. It's enriching. It's cool. They can look at comics from the 70s, 80s. And, yeah, uh, don't touch my X-Men 94. <laughs> X-Men 94. <laughs> wow, man. See, that's good. I and, have that. Oh, you do? I do. Oh, wow. My father's house is a treasure trove of the 70s. Okay. Everything was in his attic. Yeah. And and I I literally got to get over there because he took everything out of his attic and he's like yeah I got all your records and all your um your stuff yeah. I got I went over there and I got my old skateboard and my guitar okay I still have to get the comics and the records there's too many fucking records oh I bet you have a lot of valuable records man yeah. I know that there's a market for punk and hardcore records that aren't and hip hop records I got yeah. everything yeah. dude my first my first record I when I was a kid five or so. Yeah. Six or something like that. The first two records I bought, and this this will kind of kind of explain a lot for me. The first two records I bought were Grandmaster Flash, New York, New York, yeah, and Kiss, Double Platinum. Wow, those were the first two records I bought. Wow, and then That's... it just kind of all went from there. And then like fast forward a few years when when uh, Run DMC did like Rock Box and stuff, I was yeah. like, oh shit, that there we go. And I mean. You were the first guy that I kind of knew personally that was able to speak both languages. You know what I mean? You could go into this realm and go into that realm. And you brought me into the hardcore realm, even though, you know, I wasn't that familiar with a lot of stuff. But you had me performing in front of crowds that wanted to hear ITI and Madball or whatever. Yeah. Because didn't you do the ITI Madball show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I think that was it. Was right? it Babyhead or? Yeah, it was Babyhead yeah, or something like that. You know, yeah. and, and we're out there, you know talking about whatever we're rapping about we were the only hip-hop group on the bill you know what i mean so we'd get off the stage and then a band would get up and everyone would go crazy yeah well it was different you know yeah. like and that was like uh we were talking about earlier like in in new york like sick of it all and and, and krs1 would like bridge gaps and so it was all street music and yeah. it was just different different streets you know what i mean yeah, yeah, but it was yeah. all street music and, and so it made sense that it would go hand in hand and and dudes today like like you said scott vogel i know he's like a big hip-hop guy but, yeah. and he sings for one of the biggest hardcore bands that there are like you know there's it, it goes hand in hand you know yeah sure but, and on and quite honestly other than my friends that make music i don't listen to too much new hip-hop i still i'm stuck in the late 80s yeah. <laughs> it's just it's a good place what to it be. is yeah, yeah you know what i mean yeah. growing up as a kid that's that's where i am but um the uh i forgot where we were going so you were talking about well we never even really got into like kind of the, your background and stuff like you started and then we're going to go off on a lot more tangents but you yeah. know uh you know so you started with god complex and then kind of um trimmed it down to it was just seven all and esoteric you and george yeah i mean it wasn't really a full trim down because it wasn't a trim down it was just that people come and go and 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 then want to be involved to certain extents or not yeah. be involved to certain extents or like I, like I like to look at it as you know it was me and karma Ryman in god complex with 7l doing the production and then with 7l and esoteric it was me doing the rhyming with 7l in production and then karma would do the graphics yeah so well he, that's what i mean he yeah. got out and he he wanted to get out of Ryman, and he got he more into into the graphic production and yeah. then he fucking excelled beyond belief at that like he's done so many iconic record covers yes yeah and he you know he really found what he loved doing i think he really loved rapping too but i don't think he he liked it as much as i did where yeah. I was, but he could definitely keep up and write if i if i had to pick like a guy to like ghostwrite, he would know the type of shit that i want to say no absolutely you know yeah yeah and um he didn't come back until we did the bash brothers exactly yeah <laughs> Oh man! See, that's the thing. Bash Brothers. If that would, I, I stay into this day. If if we would have just took that a little serious, yeah, it would have been ahead of its curve. Like it would have been. It would have been definitely. And I thought that then, and I was like, wow, they get that Joan Jett sample or whatever. And uh, you know, you guys had something, but you know, we were too much. We were idiots at that point. Yeah, we were fucking idiots. That's like when that girl invited us to the party, <laughs> like at the loft. Um, because she thought it was like, cool to have like you guys and us. Oh yeah, yeah and then we yeah. were me and Trevor were completely fucking hammered. And remember, he f oh that's right, <laughs> we were throwing trash cans around. That's and right, doing all kinds of yeah, dumb shit. That's right, and then there was some type of tension between you and Braun because of the trash barrel. It was something. <laughs> Some shit. It's so stupid. And you were like, you're dead to me, to Braun. And, Braun. Yeah. and we were leaving. I'm like, no. It's like, am I dead to him? It was literally. It was literally we were so drunk and stupid. Yeah. I threw a trash barrel at this party. 
Yeah. But Trevor fell on the trash barrel, then I threw the trash barrel, and then Braun was mad at me for throwing the trash barrel. Then I was mad at Braun because he was mad at me for throwing the trash barrel <laughs> at the loft <laughs> party in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. That's exactly. You summarized it's so, it in like it's so stupid. Yeah, I like, haven't thought about that till yeah, just now. Yeah. But that's the good thing, man. We haven't. We've yeah. been friends for for fucking decades. We haven't caught yeah. up in a long time. So of course, shit's gonna pop up that we yeah. haven't thought of. And that is why, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, listening to this podcast is gonna be very disjointed and fragmented. But I promise, we're gonna get it back to to to, to the to the time timeline and keep going. Yeah, I, I think. Um, I think that's a nice little anecdote, man. Yeah. Um, it was <laughs> yeah I was mad because this complete ignorance being mad because yeah. Braun was mad at me for doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Like, I, I feel I, like he should have had my back and thrown the trash barrel. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's what it comes down to. I'm not talking about now. I'm talking about I know. in 2001 yeah. or whatever yeah, it was. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? That might, that, that's what it kind or, of boiled or down to. Or 99 or whatever, yeah. For sure. For and, sure. And Braun was, it's crazy because beyond her, like, he came on the scene and was doing crazy production, like Be yeah. Alert, yep. one of your iconic songs. He was like 16 when he made the production for that, yeah. wasn't he? He was yeah. like literally 16. Yeah. Well, I mean, we weren't too much older, but no, no. just a couple years older. But that's when being a couple years older made more of a difference than now. Oh, without a doubt, man. And he made he made that beat. And, you know, we went... We went to his studio or whatever. That's what got you on Barbito, stretching Barbito. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I, I think it was my verse more than the beat, but yeah. Anyway. Well, that's um, a matter no. for you and Bron to figure out. Like, it's your, it's your turn. I, me and Bron had our beef over me throwing the barrel. You guys yeah. can have. I think the whole is some of the, greater than the sum of its parts in that song. Oh. Like, it just came together. There's, like, yeah. songs that come together that yeah, are flawless. Yeah. Like, yeah. that was one. Oh, yeah. But, no, I'm fully I, – I was kind of joking. I, th I feel like that beat, no matter who was rhyming on it, would have been – Keyword, you know, yeah. quote, unquote, kind of in that <laughs> sentence. Kind of <laughs> joking. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So that, that, that got us on Stretch and Barbito. And at the time, like, that – people yeah. don't understand what power yeah. that was. Like, Oh, that's man. like the when 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 Jay Z rhymed over that. What was the yeah. instrumental he rhymed yeah. over that was became infamous. Like yeah, like um, these guys were. Everyone was it, like stuff was still in its like not infancy, but like still at an underground level. Yep. And when you made it on Stretch and Bobito, that was kind of top of the food chain on oh. the East Coast. Oh, big time! I th and uh, you know now their their lore and legacy is just you know it's it's a it's a big deal, man. And, and back then it was a big deal to us. And we were still the guys that were too cool to like take photos. You know what I mean? The stuff that we were around back then, I would never want to whip out a camera and take a picture with Bobito. But you know how dope it would be to have a picture with Bobito in '97. These situations where it was like considered uh, corny, if you were like, "Let's document this," or "Let's take a photo." There's so much shit in life that you I know? never took pictures of, like yeah, in man. anything. Yeah, it, it was kind of like a this thing where you didn't want to feel like a, a super fan. You kind of had this thing about you, but it was also taking out a clunky camera. Like, who does that? Nobody yeah. did it then. Now it's like, well, everyone's got a cell phone yeah. in their pocket, and it's like a fucking four hundred megapixel camera. Right. Like, it's crazy. It like yeah. takes a. You could you could literally take a picture that would be crystal clear on a billboard on your phone now. Yeah, that's what's insane. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think everyone expects it. If you're out, you expect people to take photos. It's not a big thing. Then it was kind of like, why are we setting up and arranging ourselves in a pose for a photo? It's just, you kind of have to draw yeah. draw it out of someone. You know, and, and not only that, but I don't care what anyone says, like, with Boston, Boston was its own thing. Yeah. And we were very protective of Boston and, like, very fuck you compared to other places because we were so much in the shadow of New York back then, which yeah. was, like, like a central hub for industry, music industry, yeah. that we were, like, Boston dudes would never want to, like, break pride and be like, yo, let's take a picture. Right. Yeah. Oh, oh 100%. Th that's the thing. That's the thing, like, that no one understands. Like, Boston dudes were like, fuck you, like fuck you this is boston yeah and even though you were it was like you were ecstatic to be invited onto the show you weren't going to show it yeah. because of some weird boston shit that's you know what that's you summarize that perfectly man and i, I still have that to this day yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter like i'm like yeah. fuck you fuck this. Yeah. like even in hardcore there was a record called this is boston not la oh yeah, yeah you, you know course, what i mean yeah. and it's like i still hold that like i like i mean i wanted to make a chop head shirt that said that this is boston not la because oh, yeah. la is like a big hub for motorcycles okay because of obviously california weather and fucking right. 
history and whatever, but like, whatever. That's a that's an aside, but it's still like People I can't would, shake it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you know, like even though I don't really fully feel that all the time, like I got friends everywhere. Like it's still like, hey, fuck you, this is Boston. It's tough to suppress, man. <laughs> yeah. Even know? though I live in Freetown, technically right now, you yeah. know what I mean? Well, not technically. I fucking live in Freetown. Like I live forty miles outside of the city. I'm still like, no, fuck you, Boston. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's more in your DNA <laughs> than yeah. it is in your uh, you know your address, and that's just kind of how things go. But I mean, there are situations where I'm like, why didn't I? Because there's there are guys out there that I see pulling up photos from eighty seven to to ninety seven that are just these iconic photos, man. Yeah. I'm like, wow. you're like you're like shit. Why wasn't Ricky Powell in the studio on this day yeah. with his little fucking camera to take <laughs> yeah. pictures? You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be the guy like, hey, let's take a picture. But I'm but I'm the guy with it in the back of my mind. I'm like, hey, we got to document this. But where's my guy that's going to take the picture? Yeah, yeah. I don't want to take the picture. I want to be in the picture. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? And if you have one of those little yellow disposable cameras, it's, it becomes a deal. And yeah. I don't want to make it a deal. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, and, and in your head, like. Uh, you know, like ego wise, it would be you wouldn't even even if you had the the Kodak little disposable on you, you you wouldn't want to be the guy that pulled it out. No, but you wanted it, but I you didn't want to be the guy exactly. to pull it oh, out, dude. I was probably at stretch of Barbado <laughs> with it in my pocket. I'm like, let me wait for the moment. Let's wait for the moment. It's not gonna happen. <laughs> Fuck that. I ain't fucking doing it. You should have, see the thing is, is and none of us with shills. We needed to bring a shill around back then just yeah. to be like, yo. At a certain point, you take pictures. Exactly. And we didn't was, do it. No, no, none of us did it. No, because there, there were. I, I feel like a lot of people have benefited from having teams that you know everyone knows what their their role is you know what i mean you have a guy that's a real dedicated photographer that wants to capture those moments and you got a guy that's we had dudes like that like lou yeah but he just didn't come around a lot he didn't come on the road that was the thing like we didn't have a guy on the road with us a lot yeah yeah i remember when uh we went to like fat beats and footwork back in the day and you know me and karma and and seven l you know we were into the polo shit and we were collecting polo and boosting polo and, and rock and polo, whatever. It was like our fucking thing. And it was inspired by Brooklyn, inspired by Mad Soul in Boston and all these guys. And we would rock it. And then we went to New York and started meeting all these guys. And they would bring out their photo albums of all the polo shit they had. And I was like, wow. Like Thurston Howell? Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. Thurston, yeah, of course. But like even like Thurston's uh, disciples, and they would pull shit out. I'm like, wow, these guys have photo albums of all the shit they're wearing posing in the clothes it was like a like an instagram that you could touch and feel and i was like we've never taken photos of ourselves wearing the shit we fucking played ourselves like the fucking polo shit that i was wearing back then it was like even at salem state there was nothing to talk i never even thought to take a picture yeah no and it's just you know i know you're as fucking estranged from the polo shit. <laughs> yeah, I didn't give a shit. Yeah, no, no, I could all. give a fuck yeah, less. I, I understand. I, I remember there was one time you bought a Nautica shirt. You had this Nautica shirt. You fucking bought it, and then you never rocked it. No, I was like, I was like, I think I bought it because it was at like Filene's basement or something. It was, was a TJ Maxx, the right from, from the place in Dorchester, <laughs> South Bay Plaza. You, and you bought it, and you were like, you brought it home, and I was saying to Brian, I was like, yo, he's gonna put that on one day, and he's like, no, he's not. And he never did <laughs> because it was like it was like peach colored, and all you, you know, I don't even know why you bought it to this day. I don't either. Everything. I don't think I've ever worn one. Dude. I think I throw. I think I did it just to fuck with you guys, maybe or something. I don't. Who fucking maybe. knows? Because you're like, you're I like just did it for the threat. Like, maybe one day I'm gonna win. Maybe it w- it wasn't peach. It was like a tan. It was like a tan, but on the back it had some type of picturesque. <laughs> it had Hawaiian. like palm trees. Or yeah, something. yeah, it had some type of scenario. I didn't think about it. <laughs> and I, and I, you know, you know, you were buying it, and I looked at Bron. And I was like, I don't know. Maybe he's gonna turn the corner. But no, you're still fucking Darth Vader <laughs> to this fucking day. All black, man. All black and camo and fucking yeah. and uh, jean or whatever. I don't know, whatever. Yeah. I mean. I will say I don't I don't care if you look at a picture of me from sixteen. Yep. If you look at a picture of me when I'm twenty five, you look at a picture of me when I'm forty five or whatever. Yeah. It's all the same shit. I yeah. didn't progress much. No, well, you know, there were times <laughs> when you had dreads and there were times yeah. when you know, it was always definitely the same vibe, man, you know. Yeah, but that whatever. That don't matter. So the dreads matter. <laughs> the dreads fucking blew my I know, mind. I know it was a source of contention. <laughs> I know it was a very big source of contention so, with you. <laughs> yeah, man. So there was you know, there was a time when I had the dreads. My dreads look like fucking. It, they look like uh, I don't know. Um, 
It looked like I just got out of the shower. I was Johnny Depp and got out of the shower and put my hair in elastics. It was just like no dread to it. Your dreads look like fucking Peter Tosh. I was. They were so gross, dude. Yeah, it was but, so gross. But they blew my mind. I couldn't wrap my head around. It. I was like, "How the fuck did he do that? How did he do that?" I'm not going to ask him, but I'm going to ask everyone around him. How did he do it? Oh yeah, he just grew him out. You know, he went diving in the fucking Atlantic Ocean, put some fucking shit in his hair. Literally, it was just wearing a fucking skull cap, like a, a, a knit hat. For it's, for years, it's dude. the commitment to it. Yeah, yeah. And, and and there was that one, the the one lady that did the fucking thing with the comb and all that shit, and fucking <laughs> fucking flared it. But those things were so fucking gross and gnarly. Like yeah. I literally, when I shaved my head for the first time, I was in Switzerland. Yeah, when I was working for the WHO. Oh yeah, <laughs> and uh, you know, this the, is a, you know the WHO, oh. World Health Organization. Yeah, yeah. It was like ninety eight or something. Not a wrestling organization. Ninety five. Yeah, yeah. It's not an offshoot of like a <laughs> Dusty Rhodes is no part of the WHO. But I remember, like, literally, they just got to a point where they started breaking, like, because like they got heavier and heavier, yeah. and like the hair couldn't support it. And I woke up one morning. And it looked like someone shit on my pillow. It was just a big fucking dread. dread yeah. And then I shaved my head and like literally walked outside and like the cool like mountain air hit my head. I almost busted a nut, dude. Yeah. I was like, this is fucking incredible. Yeah. Like, like, and then like I looked at the dreads and there was like sand and shit in it. And I hadn't been to the beach for like years. And it was still sand from the beach. Oh. Even though I used to wash my head. Oh, I know you, you did. You know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Yeah. But it was still like, it was fucking yeah. gross. Yeah. But well, you had them very long. I mean, very, you were very committed to her for a yeah. long time. Yeah. Well, the thing is, like, they would grow into each other. Like, two would turn yeah. into one and stuff. It was but I remember weird. at Salem State, you had them, like, short, kind of like on some DOS affection. I was like, oh, this fucking guy's the man. <laughs> this fucking <laughs> yeah. guy is dope. You had the Stussy fucking gas station jacket and the fucking dreads. I was like, I got to know that guy. And that's kind of where the whole thing started. Yeah. And, and, and then I, we ended up being on the radio together. Yeah, we were well, yeah. different days, but same different station, days, yeah. same radio time, same slot, different yeah. day, Tuesday and Wednesdays. Yeah, man. Stussy. They, yeah. I think they came back. They tried, oh, they're, they're trying, no, they're they're trying to come back. Yeah. No, they're back. They're killing it now. Are they? Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, they're doing very well, man. They're doing, doing great. Well, good. Hopefully they got some money to sponsor um, me and your podcast. Yeah, exactly. I like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like that idea. So uh, 7L and Esoteric, how, how many 7S, 7L and Esoteric records are there? Like full length. Uh, you know what, if I'm being honest with you, I could think about it and, um, give you a, a correct answer, but there's roughly yeah, I, three I know or four, maybe, maybe yeah. five spread I, through the years. Spread through, yeah. There, there's, uh, on the intro of the podcast, that's you from uh word association. Oh, really? Like a little big truth, big truth. Like it echoed out. Oh, that's you. Oh, man. That's so don't sue me for a second. No. Well, no, you can't sue me. It's on brick. Uh, yeah, it's on brick. That's right. Yeah, see, I, you know what you're doing. I, I'll give you a new one, man. I'll give you a, 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 yeah. a fresher one. The, yeah. Uh, yeah, it sounded good. You, you, you'll have to make my outro then because I, I, I have none. I just <laughs> I just put a little explosion or something in. Yeah, me uh, and 7 we probably made uh, one, two, three. The Speaking Real Words EP, the sole purpose, and then uh oh dangerous connection and then dangerous connection two yeah so that's yeah those are the four records and then, oh and a new dope which yeah. was like a, a very cathartic experience for us because it was very different than what we were doing before yeah now is, is there any plans to do more seven l and esoteric stuff or is it going to be mostly czar face or it's mostly czar face man you know and i i feel like what we do as czar face is really seven l and esoteric and inspect the deck and it's it's you know it's yeah. what we would do at seven L and esoteric just, without deck yeah it, without deck you know and these are the records we would make just me and seven L anyway yeah you know, I feel like deck improves the records of course but it's just uh, these are the, the type of records we would make at this point. anyway yeah so there's no reason to do yeah there's no re no reason to make a you know, at this point deck deck would be hurt if you if you made a seven L and esoteric record that's what you're trying to say right <laughs> oh he would be heartbroken <laughs> he'd be out he'd be heartbroken and so we start recording his esoteric diss track and while uh, while we're talking about this i know there's something like you 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 had ghost face on a whole record for, yeah. for the well for the most yeah, part you yeah, know yeah, yeah um is there any plans to bring any of the other wu-tang guys on or is that something you can't talk about or what's going on with that yeah um i think you know everything that has come um, to Czar Face, everything that we did on Every Hero Needs a Villain, um, our second record, had, it was with uh, Method Man was on it, Jizza was on it, first record was Ghost and Capadonna. It just all came as like favors to deck. Sure. Just like 
you know, Deck reaching out to them, like, I'm working on this new project, and these guys would hop on it, and it just made it really, uh, really easy to to get done. Well, and, but I think the formula worked, like, you know, obviously you don't need somebody else, yeah. but, like, Ghost was on, like, most of the record. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so our first record was just the Ghost rapped one, one uh, he was on one song, then we did a whole album with Ghost, and that was obviously this epic moment for us sure me and 7l yeah. for deck it's like sleepwalking you whatever know what I mean? it's, it's whatever like, yeah as he he calls it groundhog day you know what i mean <laughs> uh you know when we're waiting backstage to do a show or whatever we're talking this through he's like man this is like groundhog day for me so it's like you know when is the van picking us up when are we doing this when are we doing <laughs> yeah that? yeah but i mean there's a difference between doing a our face show and doing a wu-tang show because he can do the wu-tang stuff backwards and forwards sleep blindfolded whatever the czar face stuff is a little different because you know he's been doing the wu-tang stuff for 20 years plus um in there. Yeah, like he probably knows all the lyrics to protect your neck he might have to bone up on one of yeah, the songs for exactly. the zarfay song yes yeah. exactly so it's a, it's a little bit different but um you know we finish the zarfay sets with a lot of wu-tang stuff so that's always the big release for me when we get into the wu-tang songs because i get to just have fun and be the hype man and, and back up his vocals and it's like wow and i say to 7 I'm like yo you know you're djing for Inspect the deck because he's performing cream and he's performing above the clouds, the gangstar record and, and protect your neck and triumph. And, you know, you're doing that. And I'm over here backing him up. You realize we're doing this right now because there were times where we would be on the radio together or at Salem State or just working on music back in the day where we, we would argue about who was doper, like Wu-Tang Clan or hieroglyphics or shout out to Mike P. Shout out to Mike P. Yeah, man. <laughs> Dell Casual. 98, dude. Yeah. You know, when we went on a tour with Hieroglyphics, that was like a... F- Remember Karen, the tour manager? Yes. Yeah, to- the biggest fuckery ever was Z-Trip, DJ Z-Trip. Uh, yeah. Because none of us at that point, like, we were still kids. Yeah. And we didn't drive. Yeah, and we yeah. did, and, we, and we learned to drive. We didn't drive standard. Yeah. And he lied the whole trip and said he didn't drive standard. Made that poor tour manager drive the whole way. Yep. And then the last day, he's like, nah, I'll back up the van. <laughs> and he knew standard. He's like, I ain't going to fucking drive. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> I can't even. I had. I talked about this with 7L like three weeks ago. <laughs> Papa T spit like a sandwich in the face. Dude. Oh nah, man. Listen. <laughs> The thing with Z Trip was the most cr- the craziest shit ever. Yeah. It was a grueling tour. It was like a month it and was. a half. It was the last day of the tour. It was like to bring us all to a Wendy's or something crazy. <laughs> Some stupid. He was like, "Yeah, I'll, I'll drive us I'll over drive. there right now." I'm like, what? <laughs> what? Before that, everyone's like, "No, we don't. We don't drive standard." Yeah. I, and now I wish I could find another vehicle with standard. You can't even find a standard yeah. vehicle. You have to special order that shit now, unless you get a CTSV or something. Yeah. I truly, um, I mean, I truly couldn't drive standard. You know, I wasn't comfortable driving around. I mean, I don't. I, no, I don't want to drive every, on the other side yeah. of the road or some yeah, weird shit and can't read Audubon. the signs. Yeah, I can't read the signs. There was, a, there was a moment where I think I, I don't think I've driven over there on all the tours we've been on. I don't think I've ever got behind the wheel. I mean, I would. <laughs> yeah, you know what? <laughs> no, there was a lot of fun shit on that tour. I still remember because you know, obviously, you guys kept going over there a lot. I've only yeah. been over there with that and like yeah. f- with Blood for Blood, you know what yeah. I mean? And like some other shit, like yeah. very little, you know what I mean? So those th- those things I remember pretty well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, man, I mean, and Fat I, Beats, thanks. Uh, Fat Beats Amsterdam, Ryan Sikorsky, yeah, uh, like man. hooking us up out there. Yeah, brought us out there. That was went out, No, that was the year before I went out there and we did some shit, or I did some we, shit with Artifacts. Yeah, yeah, I was out there with you. Yeah, that's that. right. And that's then right. And we went to the Dival. There was a couple different clubs out there where fucking there was a guy urinating on himself <laughs> outside of the bar. And we had a like some type of eight millimeter camera. We were recording him doing that. That was like early. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's we still have some of that. Ah, this is a mess, this, this fucking <laughs> podcast. I, you know what? It doesn't matter because this is us catching up. And it is all over the place. We gave the disclaimer at the beginning that it was going to go all over yeah. the place, but we're going to bring it back. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Zafface, you, Deck, Deck is obviously bringing in, like, Ghostface or whatever, but, like, do you guys have plans for any more records where you're going to bring someone in that isn't on just the song but is going to be part of the record or is it shit you can't uh, talk about or don't? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we have in the works um, dealing with the music, dealing with the character of Zarface, and there are things in motion that, uh, I can't talk about now, unfortunately, but it's good stuff, and it's yeah. it's it's um, stuff that people want to keep a lookout for. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Zarface.com is the place to go. 
Zarface. Take it easy, buddy. We're oh, gonna uh, we're gonna give you a chance to give all your plugs. I thought you were, I thought you were like <laughs> no, I wasn't in the wrap up. No, 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 I was in the wrap. No, no. Oh, okay. Obviously, I'm just kidding. Zarface dot com. Like, yeah, Zarface dot com. If you're not at Chopperhead dot com, you can go to Zarface dot com. Get some vinyl, some yeah. action figures, some action figures. You know, we have a lot of stuff in, in in the works in terms of the action figures, in terms of the vinyl, in terms of the comics, in terms of the uh, uh, animated series. We have a lot of things going that aren't dealing with the actual. Music, um, music. Like this, I mean, music as far as releases go. Right now, right. that brings me into something that I always wanted that I wanted to ask you about, and I didn't even know about an animated series. So let's talk a little bit about that. Like, how did you end up getting connected to Marvel for one? And like, what do you what have you been doing with them? Like, and I know from knowing you for years, and 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 you know, we haven't we haven't hung out as much over the last you know couple of years because of, of of just life. Yeah, like I always meant to talk to you about that. Like, what a what kind of a dream come true is that for you to like be like brought into Marvel Studios and fucking yeah. go over there and work with dudes and not even just not even going there as like a tourist or like yeah. going over there on like oh some dudes like invite you over but like establishing some kind of working relationships with them like what how did that happen and what what do you got going on with Marvel Marvel was looking for music to help promote the Black Panther comic that was uh written by Ta-Nehisi Coates and that led to a variant cover for Thanos number one. It was he was posed like Zarface with the Zarface uh, logo, but it was written as Thanos. There were a lot of different things that came together through Marvel, and it kind of culminated in me writing uh, a story about Nightcrawler for the X Men, and that came by way of an editor named Chris Robinson there, who gave me a chance to write for the X-Men in an issue that Chris Claremont had also written in. And it was just this crazy situation that was such an honor. I was, my mind was, it was the most nerve wracking thing uh, I experienced that year, but I got a check from Marvel and I was like, Holy shit. This shit says Marvel. <laughs> and it was like, you didn't even cash it. Like you were like, I just yeah. want to hold the, 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 the check. That's, yeah. I mean, I left it hanging around the house a little while. You yeah. know what I mean? I was like, Hey, Andrea, look at that. You see that? Uh, Xavier, you see that shit? That says, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but, but it just got to like, haven't known you forever. Like yeah. that had been, that must have been like such a fucking high point of, or like a point of like, dude, like, oh, it was huge, shit. man. It was huge because I had to sign a bunch of like, uh, NDAs involving the discourse involving the issue and there was a point where i was sitting in staples and, and running off these contracts of marvel i'm like wow this is uh this is really hitting should i put this on instagram no i'm not going to and and you know and, and then i <laughs> the whole point of an nda yeah exactly. is to not talk about oh, shit stupid but <laughs> i know i know i know i know i know and here we are but i mean the thing is is like you know just even the letterhead from marvel it was it just meant so much to me and and you know, I've maintained a relationship with these guys, and they put my son uh, Xavier's art in Venom. Um, there are a few different things that have, you know, we've contributed to along the way that just kind of uh, I can't believe that we're part of. And that really was um, my Super Bowl in a way. Sure. Um, so everything else is kind of gravy because I would never think I would ever write anything for Marvel uh, comics. Did you ever think here. that hip hop would get you to a point where you were writing shit for Marvel comics, Absolutely. given when we were starting yeah. and you were like one of the only dudes rapping about that type of yeah. shit. Like no one gave a shit. Yeah. You know what no. I mean? Yeah, and, yeah. and it was like, you carry that torch. It was, yeah. it must've been a point of, of not only like, uh, like the inner child in you being stoked to be involved with these comics, but also yeah. like a point of, um, there's two comics that are like the top dogs, you yeah. know, Marvel and DC. You've always been kind of a Marvel guy. Yeah. Now you're fucking doing shit, collaborating with them, and music is what brought you there. So yeah, it was. Oh man, it was the most really. As I said, it was my Super Bowl, and it happened. You know, and there was several different things where we got to work Zarface into a Marvel thing. Not the actual character, but the group. You know, they interviewed us in the back of a Black Panther issue, uh, Zarface, and you know, it was it just a lot of. Things that I never thought would come to fruition. Not, uh, I mean, even just, and then also your son getting his art yeah. published in a Venom book. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's crazy. We, we, the only thing we had that was ever close to that, and I think I talked to you about this at some point, like we built a bike for a guy that was like the head of um, uh, a certain department in Hasbro. Yeah. And he was the head of the Star Wars, G.I. Joe, Transformers, 
And I forget one other toy line. That's what he did. Like he ran those wow. those lines. Oh, Indiana Jones, like shit like okay. that. Um, basically anything that was a Kenner yeah. that's Hasbro bought. And he brought us in once, and I remember just walking around, and all I could think about was you, and I was like, fuck, I wish Seamus was with me here, because we were walking through, and we're in the department, they're making figures. So I see all these, like, like uh, prototypes of, like, figures, like, guys that are, like, yeah. like hand etching the fucking molds for, like, these figures and shit, and I was like, dude, you, Seamus would flip his yeah. fucking wig right <laughs> now. And, they, and then they brought us in, for, I was in there for that, and he... um he brought us around and he was a real cool guy and and we just built we built like a sportster chopper for him and um then we ended up building another bike a triumph chopper for a guy that was like the head of or like he worked for like Hasbro but for, on all the nerf shit oh and then they brought us in cuz they did they they would do these things where they would bring people in that were creatives that were not that were outside of like the toy world. Yeah, yeah. And they brought us in as bike builders, like to show like some bikes as art, like for people that work there to get some weird kind of like inspiration or something from just on like yeah. creative shit. Yeah, yeah. It was it was a cool kind of relationship, but like nowhere near being like authoring shit for Mar for for a Marvel comic. No, it's still cool. You, you know yeah, what I mean? But it was no, cool. Yeah. But I remember thinking of you the whole time, and it was like, and I was seeing like. You know, and then the street in me was like, dude, look, look at these fucking prototype figures. I should just swipe Same one. I, yeah. I didn't do it. You know what I mean? But I was like, fuck, I could put that on eBay and fucking make a thousand bucks. Yeah. You know, what I, mean? I didn't do any of that you shit. You know it. what I mean? Obviously, but yeah. it was just fucking crazy because well, like, I, I think shit's just out on everyone's desk. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I think when people, when companies like gi giants like Hasbro or Marvel, you know, turn to you and look at your craft and want to bring you in to maybe influence or inspire their employees. That's gonna, you know, really resonate. It's fucking weird, yeah. yeah. And that's that's what I think about with, with you. Like, it must have been like a, a sense of like, not. I, there's a word, and I'm I just literally can't. Not like fulfillment, but just like, damn, dude. Like, I did something that, you know, you, your whole life you were into all this shit, yeah. and now those dudes are calling on you. Yeah. So it was like a sense of 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 of, of like. I don't know what the word is. You know what? Was, I think you know what it's rewarding. It rewarding, re yeah, yeah. Re you know, that's the simplest way to put it. And, it. and it was because it was just kind of- Or acknowledgement. Of you validation. Know I mean? Val validation. That was the exact word I was looking for, validation. I couldn't think of it. Yeah, it was, it was, it was very validating. And I mean, you know, when we were tapped to do the music for the Black Panther thing, and it was, a, it was for a comic that was written by uh ta Coates, who, you know, who wrote Between the World and Me. And, you know, my mother was like, you have to read this book. And she recommended the book and held him in high esteem, watched him on book TV and everything. And I, I got to go back to my mom and be like, listen, we're doing the music for this comic Black Panther, who was a, you know, this superhero that, you know, I grew up playing with and re reading about and all this stuff. And, you know, I know you know the author and you're a fan of the author. And here we are working together on this in a way. And that that meant a lot to me that I was able to show her like all this music stuff I've been doing has connected me in some way with to some shit she could identify. Yeah, with. yeah, you know. Yeah, that's cool, man. What's going on? You said something about an animated series. I didn't know anything about that. Yeah, well, we've had a few um, different uh, pilots and scripts and ideas and origin stories and different angles that we've been trying to pitch to people in Hollywood in a way uh, to get Zara face off the ground in an animated world, whether it's, you know, via Netflix or, you know, we were talking about the different um, streaming services and stuff. So the, all that stuff is heavily um, uh, in, in a lot of discussions and we have a lot of different things in the works that, you know, unfortunately, you can't talk, talk, about, can't yeah. talk about it, but um, a lot of cool stuff in, in, in the works in, in terms of an animated Zarface and Zarface existing outside of, you know, me and Deck rhyming. Yeah. You know? yeah. So it's just get, given its own life in the kind of comic universe, or for Ex lack of a better word. Yeah. I know um, there was a band that just did like something with Netflix that was like, it almost looked like Japanimation. Okay. Uh, where they did like all like the scoring and soundtrack for, and it was like, I can't remember what it was. It's almost like one of those like rock opera type things where there's like a whole album that has been animated. Uh, okay. I can't think of what it is. So it's okay. not even worth talking me mentioning, but, okay. but there's, 
just goes to show that there is kind of an audience for that type of stuff. So. There is, yeah. And, you know, you, you'd be surprised that um, fans, listeners, um, just consumers that would gravitate towards um, things that are more than music. You know what I mean? And if you develop the things outside of the music, such as, you know, we have the comic books and we have the action figures, and it kind of builds a universe around this character. I think one thing that's cool, man, and I think we talked about this earlier, and I know not to get, I don't want to get too personal, but I think it's probably your kids are probably living a pretty fucking awesome life in that they got a father that's in the <laughs> shit that kids are into. <laughs> yeah. So, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like, you know, like, I know you, I knew your father. Yeah. But, Rest in peace. You know what I mean? Like your father was, you know, you're like a chip off his shoulder. You know what I mean? He might not have been into the comics and the shit that yeah. you're into, but your yeah. kids, like, you know what I mean? Like I, I haven't, I haven't seen Xavier since yeah. he was like a fucking baby, yeah, to, yeah. to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. But I'm sure they're more like a chip off your shoulder, but they get to experience life with you, like bringing them around and like being into shit that they're probably into. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's it, you know it's been um, very fulfilling and fun and an adventure, man, to have you know my son and daughter. But you know my yeah. son's eleven now, so throughout you know the past decade, you know I've been able to enjoy everything that I grew up with a second time. Yeah, that, and yeah. you know when we started Zarface, a lot of it, a lot of the motivation for me was to create something that I could work on while he grew up and kind of incorporate him into it. You know, in the comic books, he's also a character. He's like Zarface's sidekick. So he would have like, you know, a role in it. It's something that, you know, just something to kind of grow up around. Yeah, and not to mention on the records, you bring them in. Yeah. And yeah, let them like do little choruses or yeah. hooks or whatever, you know. Yeah, and, and, and that, you know, in my mind, they'll be able to look back on that. Like, wow, that was, you know, a lot of fun making those records and being part of the records. You know, and he's at he's at a point where and it's he wears Zarface hoodies to school like every day. And I, I try I put I put I hide them and I stuff them in the back of his closet and he goes around the Patriots things and goes around the Nike things and pulls out the Zarface thing and comes out of his room with it on. And it's like it means tons to me, even though he doesn't listen to a lot of the songs because a lot of the songs have a lot of vulgar language or swears or whatever. He listens to the instrumentals and stuff, but he comes out with the hoodie on. He's so proud to wear it. And he'll yeah. wear a different one every day. And it, it, it's like, and then his buddies come over and they'll leave with Zarface stuff. So now his, his whole crew is wearing Zarface things yeah, at yeah, school. Yeah. And, and if nothing else, that means, you know, just the fact that he has this blind allegiance to Zarface without even really knowing what the full saying. spectrum yeah. yeah it just it it it's it means a lot man and well enjoy it now before he gets to his yeah. rebellious stage and he's like fuck you and he's like you know listening know. to like trap music or some other yeah. whatever is going on by then <laughs> yeah i know i know i know he made his first meme the other day where it was like a picture of um baby yoda with um cutting the head off of Django fett and the mandalorian holding some chicken nuggets and like I don't know. Baby Yoda was like, "Listen, if you don't bring me twenty nuggets, this is going to be you." And it's like the bloody Django Fett head on the floor. I don't know something that he just <laughs> made on the computer by himself. I'm like, "Wow, he's getting into memes. This is a yeah, strange, strange world, strange period." Yeah, yeah. But you know, the way that they've worked into it, despite you know a lot of the foul language we use here and there, it's it's, it's been it's really worked out uh, well. You know. This yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's cool that now. you could evolve them. Yeah, bring them in the mix and stuff, and yeah. let them feel involved, and they might not take it as personally when you have to go away for a week or two on tour and right. this and that. <laughs> yeah, like, like yeah. you know. Yeah. 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 Now, what's going on? I, I know we talked a little about a little bit about this earlier. Like, what's going on with all this comedic connections? I know I got to see Tom Segura pumping Zaffy's face and fucking Burt Kreischer and stuff. What? what yeah. How did that? <laughs> I know you're a longtime fan of comedy, yeah. even yeah. from you were the first dude to ever tell me about Bill Burr when we still lived on Bellflower Street in Dorchester. You go see him play small venues, like yeah. you know what I mean. So, like, how yeah. how did this come about? What's going on with that? Um, you know, it just I think it just came from being around the same age as we are being fans of hip hop it just kind of somehow the social media and internet kind of connects all these people. And it, it, there's a guy that can connect, uh, 
us and Tom Segura. And, sure. and you know what I mean? And they're like, wow. And they listen to the music like, oh, wow, I, I dig this, you know? And it just blows my mind. So I'd be laying in bed with Andrea watching a Tom Segura special two years ago, right? And watching them, and I'm like, this guy's fucking hilarious. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm writing a rhyme or whatever, and I say something, what up, Tom Segura, in the rap. I put the record out, and then there's all these kids tagging him. Hey, you shouted out Tom Segura. And then Tom Segura reaches out, and, hey, I really like this record. And I'm like, wow, man. It just started from me uh, making a reference to him in yeah. a song as a sign of respect. Which is very common in hip hop throughout it's been the going ages. On. It's been going on since uh, you know we were making records and you were referencing Sucker Man and whoever the whoever else you know in Force Five. There's, yeah. there's, that's, that's different type of thing. You know, you just draw on different things in rap. Sure. But today in 2020, there are people that will hear the lyrics and you know in 1996 or 2000 whatever you know when we started a whole record with Dusty Rhodes doing an intro, it would never reach Dusty, Dusty Rhodes. Rhodes. Yeah, yeah. Today, all it takes is one kid to yeah. tag him in a f- social media post or like a, 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 you know, on whatever social media yeah. venue, you know, and, and, and then it's, Dusty Rhodes hears and is like, "Hey, I dig this," yeah. you know, and, and and it's just we've never changed what we've done. But and speaking I, of wrestling, not this. If yeah. anyone's listening that knows Abdullah the Butcher, I still own AbdullahTheButcher dot com and Abdullah dash the Butcher dot com, and <laughs> they could be for sale for the right price. Wow, man. I was watching an Abdul the Butcher promo yesterday. Wow. That's crazy. I, I own AbdulLaTheButcher.com. And I didn't do it to be a dick and like try and put a stranglehold on him for his own name. Right. But I think some dude reached out to me like 10 years ago saying, hey, look, I'm doing an album with Abdul the Butcher. We want to buy the name. I'm like, all right, whatever. And then they never really got back to me. I think an they album? offered me like 50 bucks or something for an the album. Yeah, but I don't think that ever came out. Last I heard, he owns like a barbecue joint in Atlanta or something. Wow. But I... th- just it was just a funny wrestling thing that I know that you would appreciate yeah. aside. Yeah. So because you brought up Dusty Rhodes. Well, we had the, you know, the Kerry Von Eric in the ho- in the apartment. Explain this because <laughs> because because Poncho is going to be listening to this. Oh, and boy. He had strong opinions about your Kerry Von Eric. Did he? Yeah. I can't remember exactly what it was. He's like, why do you guys have like a big wrestler in your house? Oh, and, like, yeah. But I was like. At the time, Seamus was seeing a girl whose father was a professional photographer, took this picture of Kerry Von Eric, yeah. who was, uh, you know, you know, I know you used to go by Kerry Von Esoteric. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it was this whole thing, right? And then we went down to, you know. Um, but, but oh, so for people who had never been to the Bellflower Lan- Mansion where we had this on display that you, yeah. it was like beyond life-sized. Yeah. Big photo, like, what was it, like? eight feet tall or something by like four feet wide, six feet wide. And it it hung in her dad's photography studio because he was in Texas. He was in Dallas and he would photograph the Von Erics. And I had a relationship with his daughter and, you know, as a, I guess as a gift to me, he said, listen, I know you like this Carrie Von Erick, gigantic professional photograph. (laughs) You can take it's like this. the biggest photograph I've ever seen in my life outside of a museum. It was so fucking so ridiculous. Good, right? Yeah, so good. <laughs> and, and, and like the greatest thing ever. And it was like mounted. It was just incredible. Yeah. He's like, you can take this back to Boston with you. You know? <laughs> yeah. If and, you can get it back, you can. Yeah. And, and you found a way. I found a way because, uh, you know, we had taken a U-Haul back from, from Dallas and we put it in the U-Haul and, and drove it back to, to Boston. And, you know, um, then I wound up leaving the Bellflower Mansion, and you had it on display for a little while, and I don't know where the fuck, what happened to it. Now, this is a source of contention, because I don't remember throwing it out, but you seem to think that I put it out on the curb. Yeah. Yeah, you did. I mean, there's not a, there's not a curb that could withstand the fucking <laughs> yeah. size of that like, thing. Who the, like, where did that go? Like, if you live in the greater Boston area, or yeah. anywhere in the States, for yeah, that yeah. matter, and you have, like, an eight-foot-tall Kerry Von Eric. Yeah. Mounted photo, like, you know, like framed mounted photo. Yeah. Um, you know, give us a shout. And, it uh, belongs It belongs to us. And, <laughs> um, you know, it was as big as like a UPS truck, the size of a fucking UPS truck, <laughs> yeah. the side of a UPS truck. It, it was a Kerry Von Eric. He's in the ring. And no. He's just posing and flexing. I remember it was Hank. There was a, a sweaty man in tights in our living room. Yeah, you were a good sport Forever, it. forever, yes, yeah. It, you, it was great. And and I I would just have that just looking over me often. <laughs> no, no, I was looking over the living room. It was over the entire <laughs> Wasn't it in your room for a while and then you moved it to the living room? I, I, I don't remember. I don't know. Might have been. 
Might have been. Yeah. Might have been a little creepy in the, in the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> but hey. but we digress. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, like, so you were talking about just, and I think one of the things that's important about that is it's fucking weird now. Like everybody is reachable yeah. to some extent, not everybody, but yeah, almost yeah. everybody like dudes, like when we were growing up, you would never think you were going to just be able to reach out to like cool Keith or, or, or somebody. Right. Right. But yeah. now they're on, everyone's on social media. You can DM them. They might not look at it. It yeah. might be the publicist that really looks at it, but there's a good chance that you can get at anybody growing up. That was, you know, wasn't, was untouchable to you before Un, not untouchable, but unreachable. Yeah. So yeah, it's good. And it's bad because you know, it creates opportunities like this, but it also dispels mystiques because I end up following people and I'm like, fuck this guy. You know yeah. what I mean? And it sucks. That's the downside of social media. Like you get, you get to see too much of somebody and you're like, someone you thought was like fucking awesome. Yeah. And you're like, fuck this fucking Ex dude or fuck her, or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? That's the kind of downside of things, it, but it happens all the time. You know, the, the, the expression never meet your heroes has been around forever. Yep. But now it's like, you can really get a real, glance in at your heroes and it's yeah. like oh man the daily life like i don't need to see you walking your dog or I, yeah. whatever or actually i do want to see you walking your dog yeah, but yeah. i don't need to see you at the post office in line or fucking right you yeah. know whatever like, you i know, know what, i know what fucking pancakes look like man yeah. you know or yeah. I, I i see i you know i've cooked fucking yeah. chicken or whatever yeah. you know and it, but that, that stuff is fine man it just the it, problem is is when we grew up your hero was still your hero yeah. And they were all there was it was almost something bigger. But in reality, your 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 hero is still a fucking person that gets up, takes a dump, fucking shaves right. or fucking yeah. does whatever, fucking puts their pants on. Yeah. And they do the same shit you do. Yeah. And it sucks because it almost dispels the myth. You exactly. know what I mean? We, we didn't have that context. So we had, you know, when we were really young, we had 30 minutes of Spider-Man or whatever. And for me, it was like 30 minutes of Spider-Man animated series or whatever it was. It was like, OK, that that guy is really cool and he kicks ass. Then we got a little older, and it, for me, it was a Big Daddy Kane record or something, you know? And it was like, wow. Like, if I was in New York hanging out with this guy, like, this would be the coolest thing ever, because this guy obviously makes no mistakes. He's the coolest guy in the world, you know what I mean? Yeah. And we, I don't think about Big Daddy Kane taking a shit, but, you know, he's got some bad days, too. Yeah. Now, if I'm on Instagram... You see I, a picture of him posting while he's taking a dump, <laughs> 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 and then with the hashtag, where, where I dump, you know it what might, I mean? Something, <laughs> no, be, I don't know. No. I don't think Kane's doing yeah, that. I don't think and, he's either. And not to bring it back to your boy, Tom Segura, but gonna, he has a whole fucking, hey, Kane! Uh, you know, what's up, Kane? What's yeah, up? Yeah, yeah. I saw someone with a shirt that just said, sup, Kane, oh, on really? it. Yeah, oh, like, he, there's, there's, he, there's a whole marketing thing behind that, whether it's him or not, you know? Might, yeah, that was, I mean, that was a great bit. That was a great yeah. but but see then see so he speaks the the language of hip hop he understood it and that's kind of how maybe we connected but the one time that that held true is when i was a kid yeah. at like 5 7 years old yeah. my father took me to the world of wheels i think it was world of wheels or one of those shows and i met Lou Ferrigno but he was in the hulk costume and attire that didn't let me down i met my hero and it was cool oh, like that's I, cool. and i got a picture but in the picture, I was such an asshole even at a young age. I had to be too cool for school. I had like a little spark, like, like whatever. Like whatever. If I find it, you'll laugh your ass. I'm like, oh, I, I mean, we all would. Yeah, and then yeah. there's a picture of me in front of the general, general Lee. And I know I was so stoked as a kid, but I was like, yeah. whatever. You yeah, know what I mean? Just being song. just fucking Boston asshole yeah. shit. You that's know what I mean? That's what Xavier's like, man. <laughs> Xavier, he, well, he's better now, but he used to put on a face. You know, yeah. like I'm like, dude, smile, man. Like, whatever. And you know yeah. he's stoked beyond belief. Yeah. You know? But you guys put his face on, yeah. Yeah, everybody's human, but it's just some people you don't want to take as that. Some people, the Chuck D's, the KRS ones, the um, LL Cool J, whoever it might be, you want to be let in. Like like uh, Han Solo, right? Harrison Ford. What happened in that original trilogy? That's all I need to know, right? I've had my uh, adventures with him. It's good. Case closed. I'm fucking my fucking idol, right? Chewbacca too. Whatever they did in the, that, those three movies, that works for me. That's a perfect thing for me. I don't need anything else. I can Back then, I could take my toys, have my own adventures based on what they're like. Then you want to expand on it and you want to take it in different directions. And it's just like if you're adding things that aren't already – that I, I built things in my head. Don't tear them down now for the fucking dollar. Yeah. Well, you know. You what? Can, <laughs> what? You talk to your boys at Disney about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know. I know. But, but maybe don't because they might be doing the animated zombies. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, right. I know. And then you get in a position where you don't want to diss everybody. And it's like, 
you know <laughs> but no but back to to the real world what we were talking about besides uh esoteric fantasy land yeah tom zagura you guys met because people hashtagged you in a song that yeah. you shouted him out and yeah. then he actually heard it and then listened. Exactly. So yeah. you set an example. Now every young aspiring rapper is going to hashtag everybody they like. And they're going to shout out everyone they like. Yeah. Hoping some yeah. motherfucker hashtags yeah. fucking <laughs> hashtags the dude that they're fucking ref- or the dude or the gal that they're referencing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, exactly. you know, it only works once. Lightning only strikes once, right. motherfuckers. Don't don't right. follow suit. You're just going to play yourself. I know. There's going to be songs. Fucking <laughs> Kevin Hart, Jerry yeah. Seinfeld, yeah, Mind yeah. Mel, Rob yeah, Lockfeld, yeah. and yeah. all this shit. It's yeah. like, yeah, I mean. I don't know. That's that's a it just happens. But it's things that I we've think been the, doing. Yeah, you yeah. did it from a genuine place. You, yeah. you weren't doing it with the intention of getting someone's attention. You you right. do that all the time. You fucking shout me out in songs yeah. like for like I'm like what the fuck is he? <laughs> like, yeah. That's cool, but whatever. Oh, you know yeah. what I mean? That's just for, coming oh, or, from a or place everybody. of respect, man. Yeah, you know? it's just you know it's just something you do. But yeah. I don't think I, I set out with a fucking strategy and a blueprint. Like all right, let's see, Tom Segura. <laughs> yeah. Let me go with him. He's reachable. <laughs> if I just shout him out, I know. So like at least seven kids are going to hashtag and and, 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 and and reach out to him and tag him in something and yeah. I'll get to him. You didn't... No, that wasn't in the works, but when I started developing, I'm like, oh, that'd be, that'd be pretty cool oh, if you actually it. heard the song, you know? Yeah. And then it worked out. Yeah. And, yeah. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, it's cool. But also, you know, you being a legitimate fan of comedy, you know, it's yeah. worked out, you know? Oh, I mean? man, nothing better than comedy, man. I think the art is, there's a lot of similarities to hip hop, a lot of similarities in the performance, the risk, the thrill. The timing, the cadence, the delivery, everything. There's so many different things that I can watch a comic perform. What's a verbal out for? Him. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And you're putting, you, you're, you're putting yourself out there in front of all these people looking for laughs. Whereas as an MC, you're looking for head nods or hands in the air. Yeah. And it's like you're putting it, you're putting it Either out way, there. Either way, you're putting it out there for, for respect in yeah. whatever form it is. Definitely. So but you don't got a DJ backing you to, to help you out. You don't. And so you're you're point. there by yourself, and that's and if you bomb, there's no nothing. blaming anything, right? And you hear, see, if I'm rapping, and I got the, the fucking beats booming in the background, if someone's like this motherfucker's whack, I can't hear it because I'm still rhyming. Yeah, if you're a comedian and you someone that, heckles you, oh, yeah, there's you no heckled, there's man. no soundtrack to to, to no. drown it out. Oh man, so it's yeah, I got a lot of respect for comedians, man. It's a beautiful art, man. Well, you know, it makes me think too. Like, remember back in the day, there used to be a lot more like freestyle battles that were hosted, you know, judged. Yeah, and you know, that, that, not that comedy's judged in the same way, but you know, if you if you fucked up and you were doing something live. You know, you were subject to to heckles, oh, and, yeah. and there was accountability right there. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, like, you know, the same thing with a with a comic. You know, it's it's live feedback in the moment. You're trying something, it works or it doesn't. Exactly. And then you know, the next time you come yep. a little bit sharper. Which I think is why places in L.A. on the Strip, like the Comedy Store, or the Laugh Factory, you'll see huge comedians pop up to try new material. To get a vibe from people, you know what I mean. They won't yeah. be built, but they'll show up just to try something out. And the fans will be like, "Holy shit, it's Tom Segura!" And he's he's there to try new material. Too. Just doing ten minutes or yeah. fifteen minutes to, to get a, to get a read. Yeah, you know what I mean. But that's like the thing with comedy; like you can't practice it alone in your room. Yeah, yeah I mean, you can to try and get your cadence or yeah. memorize shit, but until you do it in front of people, you, the whole genre exists to make people laugh. Exactly. And so you can't do it alone. I mean, you can you can do it just from from memorizing or kind of getting your set, but you're not going to tweak your set till you do it live and you see what works and what doesn't. Right. I guess the same thing with you know with music too. Like you know, you get to rehearse it a little more and record it or whatever. But yeah. when you do shit live, you're going to see what hits and what doesn't. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, and what it, resonates and what doesn't. They were talking about Bert and Tom were talking about how when they perform and they you know every show they do they work you know they're working on their hour perfecting their hour for their next special or whatever. And when they get to the end and they've mastered that hour, it's very um, depressing because there's no, it's going to be bittersweet. Yeah. There's no risk. There's nothing. They know what they're doing and you know, they'll get the pops from the crowd or whatever, but it's all rehearsed and they just, there's no edge to it for them, for the fans. It's a, it's great. Yeah. The first time hearing it. Yeah. 40th or 450th time yeah. saying it it's not as does it get like that with music for you like any of the old songs that you don't want to do that people want to hear oh, definitely yes yeah, that de- definitely going through the motions with a lot of the songs you know what i mean but it's it's still exciting when you know there are new songs that you do and you get to see a reaction to it and 
know that you're still making music that people find. You know, we have new, we get with the Zarfe stuff, we make, I feel like we make new fans through just through the merchandise or just through going through outlets like Zoomies. Yeah. It brings in people that would go into a Zoomies store and buy the shirt and learn about the group secondhand and like, oh, wait. This is more than just art. Yeah. Right? What what am I rep, what am I wearing and yeah. representing? And yeah. then they find out about it. And- they'll walk in and they'll know that Lamore Supreme drew this character who's really cool looking. What else? Let me type Zarface in. Oh wait, they make music. Wait, it's affiliated with a guy from Wu Tang. What what is yeah. going on? And they'll listen and, and they'll appreciate it. And then we have a new fan, and the kid is like eighteen. I'm like, wow. Yeah. You know and fortunate you know shouts to my man dustin who and your man dustin who uh you know helps a, a lot of the behind the scenes coordinations with a lot of the czar face merchandise and the czar face direction in general and uh, apart from the music sure know? yeah man and, and it's cool because it all is is a symbiotic relationship like with all the stuff yeah but they all could stand on their own yeah, and that's yeah. what's cool about it like you know yeah someone can go sh- see the shirt and just like it for the art and then later find the music, and then maybe f- later find comic or a fucking animated series or whatever yeah. that has nothing to do with the music, or you know, right. except like the art or yeah. like maybe a passing reference or something. Yeah, you know, and the, the, you know, and th- those things for me are just writing the comics is just about as rewarding as is making the the music, you know, because these are things I, I started writing comics before I started writing rap lyrics in it to have them kind of come together now on the same platform is is something i you know i never expected to happen plus it just must be keep things interesting for you because you know you can work on music you've been working on music since, yeah. ever since i've known you <laughs> so it finally broke this stool this stool finally broke. I, I threw a conniption fit like a week or two ago about something. And I was smashing the stool and it never broke. And at the height, the height of, of drunken stupidity where I was just trying to get it under control and bring it back to like a to like a, 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 a manageable podcast, it broke and it fucking pure comedic value right here. Under that, I take a sip of Tito's. <laughs> Fuck oh yeah. My God. I knew too. I was like, dude, I got to get rid of this stool because I I compromised it the other day. I got some bad news, and I'm not I'm not proud of it. I was smashing the the stool around, and I was like, yeah. and then I was actually impressed with the durability of the stool because yeah. it didn't completely smash. Yeah. But ever since then, it's had a weird wobble, and I don't know if yeah. you've noticed, but I've been like playing the wobble the whole time, like because I have like ADD and I can't help it. Like I have restless legs and all that shit. Yeah, I didn't know. And notice. it finally, it finally did it. Oh my god! I'm glad it was me yeah. and not a customer, so that I don't right. have a fucking lawsuit on my hand. Yeah, well, you got right back up pretty well. I mean, you're bleeding. But I'm that's ble- fine. bleeding profusely from every <laughs> orifice uh, as the stool went. But yeah, man. So getting back as the professional, we're going to get back to the. Fun. But it, yeah, it must be cool to work on all those different projects because even though it's a character you created, you guys have developed and brought to life. But it's different aspects of things, so it's not like you're just writing, you know, music about it. You're you're involved in comic stuff or like um, different kind of uh, creative creative outlets for the same brand, even yeah. though they're not connected. Uh, like like the story isn't the same for all of them. Yeah, I, I think we're fortunate to have a music outlet, a merchandise outlet, a comic outlet, action figure outlet. It's just different things, you know. You're, I mean? you're pretty much dr- living your fucking dream life. Yeah, I, I, in a way. <laughs> in a way. Yeah, in, in, no, in certain aspects, I you am, know what I mean? No, I, I am. I have a trouble I have tr- trouble admitting it or realizing it, I guess, but I mean, I'm in a group with the guy from Wu-Tang Clan, which is just fucking weird, right? right? Yeah, yeah first it's, it was off. weird and it's fucking, you know, just a, a complete honor, mind-blowing s- scenario and I am also creating You're also character. walking into yeah. Marvel and yeah. doing some shit with uh, you know, uh, some stuff with the dudes from Marvel yeah. and doing the other yeah. shit. Yeah, it just kind of, it, it's uh, working out right now. You know? Fuck yeah, man. But, Fuck you know, yeah. You de- just as you, you know, you dedicate yourself to something and, and um, you know, if you get lucky just and put in the work, 
you get to a place where you can, you know, enjoy the, the benefits from it. Yeah. So I know we've, we've talked about a lot, man. Is there, I mean, what's going on in the future? Anything else that we haven't talked about? Any touring? I know you just did, you guys performed in LA. Yeah. I know it might be harder to tour with you guys now, you know, but. Um, it's tricky. Yeah, man. Cause you know, Wu-Tang is always on the road. They just had their 25th anniversary. So they're getting a lot of, a lot of shows, a lot of dates for a lot of money and um, they're staying very busy. So. The Zarface stuff is usually, um, you know, well, Deck is the backbone of a lot of classic Wu Tang songs. Yeah, of course they they can't do it. they yeah. can't do it at this point without them. Yeah, I so, mean, a much more minute. I'm in a band. I get it. It's like I'm in a band with dudes from Agnostic Front and Slapshot. Yeah. Like those. That's what's going to be bread and butter and and priority because you know. And then when we can play. You, the war machine stuff we we do it but right it's good because we're all busy yeah and that and other shit you got a lot of stuff on your plate otherwise too Definitely. so it's Definitely. hard to fit in with uh with, you know you're developing comics and and and, and you know animated series so yeah so that stuff needs work you know like exactly. it doesn't happen independent you know yeah we're able to work on that stuff um in between making music and going on the road and stuff like that, so that's how it works. Yeah. So. Any uh, AOTP stuff on the uh, on the horizon? Not really, man. You know, we we've, we've been talking about doing doing uh, records as AOTP. You know, and Vinny's been on the fence. I've been on the fence. I mean, I'm I'm I've been actually really committed to doing it, but you know, uh, there are a lot of projects that are up in the air for Vinny. A lot of projects that are you know is our face stuff that's working for me and and. Uh, we got a little derailed again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what's going on? Anything else that you want to uh, that we haven't talked about that you think is important or you want to bring up or that we that we missed? Zarface dot com is the place to be uh, if you want to learn anything about Zarface and at Zarface underscore so is my Instagram and Twitter and that's uh, I think that's about it, man. Cool, man. Um, I definitely want to thank you for coming on. It was good just fucking catching up, dude. Like, as a, as always, it's been a long time coming. We've been threatening to do it for a long time. And good yeah. thing we found an outlet like this to to uh, to to force our hand and make us do something. Yeah, man. I just got to get into a little bit of housekeeping before I sign off for good. Uh, today, I definitely want to thank Chop Cult for being a sponsor on this show. If you don't know who Chop Cult is... Um, they are one of the biggest and best news resources and social networks dedicated specifically to modern chopper builders and bike riders. Um, go to chopcult.com for weekly features, blog dumps, classifieds, and one of the most active online uh, forums that there is related to motorcycles uh, now. Uh, you know, forums was huge years ago, not so huge now. But the Chop Cult one is one of the most active ones there is out there. There's a lot of members. There's a lot of stuff going on. And the membership for it is free. So it's not going to cost you anything to go check it out. Again, and then you can also follow Chop Cult on all the social medias, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and Pinterest, simply at Chop Cult, C-H-O-P-C-U-L-T. And while you're at it, um, you know, this cost me a lot of money to do. I do it all by by myself. There's there's no uh, no one backing me. So uh, go to chopahead.com, buy a t-shirt or something. Help us uh, keep this rolling. www.choppahead. If you're in New England, uh, we are a full service motorcycle shop. We do everything from oil changes to full custom builds. You want a chopper built? Let us do it. We've been doing it for a lot of years. Uh, you've seen us in the magazines and you've seen what we do. If not, come by and come talk to us and uh, we will convince you that you're the, we're the ones you want to build your chopper unless you're going to build it yourself. Um, if you need parts, service, swag, gear, give us a call or stop by or check it out on chopperhead.com 24-7 hours a day. And that's about it. I want to sign off today. Uh, feel free to listen to the other episodes and hit subscribe if you like what you're listening to. Thank you. I'm wig splitting, I chop a head quicker than truth does. You are stuff like bedtime kids, you're useless. Oh, oh. useless, 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 useless. You love podcasts. The stories, the laughs, the unexpected turns. But when this episode ends, the silence starts. Not anymore. Audiobooks.com turns that silence into your next great adventure. 
With over 450,000 titles, from bestsellers to hidden gems, your love for listening just found its new best friend. And because you already know the joy of audio, we're giving you three free audiobooks to start your journey. Imagine your favorite podcast, now with unlimited episodes. That's audiobooks.com. Keep the story going. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. Because for podcast lovers like you, the end of an episode is just the beginning. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E.